All right, there's my YouTube stuff came up. I need to set the title. Co-learning cloud native. Oh, people are asking about Knative at work. Um, I don't know if I like Knative. We need to talk about that. Kubernetes, rvxrob.tv. Um, so, so there you go. So let me, I'm going to go ahead and do my, first of all, let me check the YouTube title, make sure it changed. Yippers. Okay. Uh, cancel. Good. So I think we're good to go. So let me just do my obligatory, obligatory kind of like catch up here. Um, I've been writing boost content all morning. So Friday afternoon is co-learning Kubernetes cloud native stuff. Um, and I have a playlist for it. So if you go out my, uh, my YouTube, you can go find the playlist. I don't do any VODs on Twitch just cause it's just too hard to manage videos in two places. Um, so yeah, so you can go out there and check it out. Um, I haven't really had a log for the learning. Um, and I kind of had it in as Edelcast and I go back and forth on the particular thing because I like, do I want to have structured learning in there and see what I've covered or not, or, or do I not? Um, so, but I actually do think there is a boost where we started doing this. Let me see if I can find it. So is that, um, I don't remember it cause it was last week. So let's do, is that find, there we go. Friday's still three. Well, that's the one. So, um, let me actually pass that on to you. So this, that's the Zettel number. If you want to go find it, my Zellcast. And I want you to know that I am working diligently to create a static site generator for my Zettelcast and stuff uh, so that it'll all be webified. And I want to make um, a community portal so that it'll get you know picked up by Google and stuff like that. I've been using my Pixel and I've really been enjoying Google sending me you know, web pages that match my hits. And I realize that's never going to happen until I make it into a web page. So that's always been the plan, but I, I felt it was more important to capture the data in an organized way than to, to run off, make a website out of it you know, and make it into Hugo. I won't be using Hugo for that. I'll just do my own thing. But that kind of stuff you want to watch, I'll be doing Go programming tonight, maybe tomorrow. Um, actually, tonight, you know what? Tonight, I think I might start out with the Go programming before I just kind of devolve into playing Witcher all night, <laughs> like later, right? So... Use some of that positive energy after that. So for the rest of the day today, here's the plan. Um, I'll be I'll be doing uh, nothing but cloud la cloud native and Kubernetes learning related to the stuff that I did at work today this week, and I have a very specific uh, thing to cover today that I I'll let you know in a bit. And then the schedule after that, uh, I'm gonna I'll be you know do my run from three to four or whatever. Uh, at least by six or so, I'll be back. And I'm, I'm my plan is to do some some Go coding on the conf-go project, which has got a playlist if you want to catch up on YouTube. And it's just a configuration system that I use in Go. It's a very, it's a library I want to be very dependable because I'm migrating a bunch of my other Go projects to use it, and including my static site generator, which eventually will be um, uh, set up for Zet. Zet, Zet will, uh, just so you know, I've been using Zet, this command here, right? The Zet command will eventually be a standalone multi-call but also a sub command of mim mim uh which will be a part of mimworks which is a, a all-encompassing um sort of knowledge management suite uh that i've been planning for some time so that's that's kind of a that's kind of a thing uh just to give you a sense of what that if you want to if you want to track any of that stuff uh, it's going to be a long time. I mean, the whole thing's not going to be done for probably a year or so. But if you want to participate in the development of that, that that's going to be an open project. Uh, moving it to Go is going to take a long time because we can't just use, you know, sloppy rapid applications development like we have in Bash. And I, I'm not quite ready to cut it over yet, but I am ready to start developing some of the, the, the dependent libraries uh, so we can get there. Um, what does that relate to Kubernetes and stuff? 
because that's how you're going to be able to find this right now to find this you have to go to my github and um so uh, i could do give um no wait is that is that chat and that will stick it in the in the twitch chat um if you would like it uh, it does make a little post to the Twitch chat. It's not going here. Let me see if I can show it to you. Um, and I'm a little, I'm a little afraid of posting the the Twitch chat again. So, um, uh, hmm. Hmm. I'm just reading work chat. I am doing this during the work day, so I apologize. I'll be occasionally distracted by work things i might have to take a break during it uh you just have to know to fast forward during those times uh i, I wouldn't be doing the streaming like this if i weren't uh, you know I, I i do want to take a moment to call out to make a shout out to the new um tag so there's now a tag called co-working co-dash working and i can't remember who it was who was it out there you guys there somebody out there recommended that i add it to my thing they actually lobbied to have it added and I thought that was really great because last year, over the last year and a half, I've been streaming. I've been pushing really hard um, to have that, to have more people start doing co-working and co-learning um, as a means of like having a cubicle without a cubicle next to you, right? Um, it's great. I really love it. I mean, I feel like it's been really, um, I love that tag for, for, for other co-working streams. Yeah, I, I'm i super happy they added it because I think that that shows that Twitch is kind of evolving away from just, you know, covering games. Uh, which makes sense because you know half of their their viewership is is just chatting, so it's co dash working is the tag. So if you click on co working, in fact, I should probably highlight the tag in my about and say, hey, if you want to watch other coworker streams, um, click on this link. You know, because that's something I really, really strongly believe in. I I I really, really believe in. In co-learning and co-working co-learning is just another form of co-working we're just learning is you know we're just learning it together so um i also like this method of of just in general as a pedagogy you know pedagogical approach or you're going to call it because it's very it's it's very open and it's it's just by example kind of stuff it's not stuffy it's more like we're all in the lab together and we're just in a study group and i always use that metaphor of, hey, we're just in a study group, you know, this is how it goes. Last week, ours devolved into throwing food at each other. I mean, in the best, funnest way, most, you know, entertaining way. It wasn't really a negative way, but it was definitely not very productive <laughs> at the end. It is Friday, though, so, you know, whatever. So, Arth Vader, how's it going? So, um, something that did make me kind of sad yesterday, I saw that one in particular sensuous streamer had more viewers than the entire silence of the object course <laughs> that's just humanity dude or do that <laughs> i feel yes it's frustrating it's definitely frustrating i i, I hear your frustration but it's just humans <laughs> just i mean just 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 compare the viewership of anyway we won't we won't, we won't get into the commentary about on society about the nature of streamer popularity we cannot go there if, if we go there we'll be there all day <laughs> so we won't get mad or frustrated or we're just going to get busy busy learning so what are we actually learning um oh wait i gave that to you again i didn't mean to i meant to edit it that time so i'm going to cd into that directory um i hope this works i think it might not be fixed yet it isn't damn it do I not have that? I need to fix my dir thing. Yeah. I need to. I, I'm, I'm going to refuse the, the temptation to do that right now. But I need to just make it so it takes an argument so that it'll add it to the end. Yeah, there we go. All right. So, yeah, there's my log. All right. So, Tmux in. I just every week I forget how I'm doing. So I have this Zet that I've been using to, to, to keep track of my questions as I go and kind of my learning as I go, uh, particularly interesting things. Um, I don't really need a lab for this. I've, I've got a number of other learning labs that are related to specific topics, and this is just kind of the general, what did we cover that day? Um, and I'm going to put a timestamp there. Turn my eskies on so you can see how I'm typing all this. 
All right, so what are we doing today? Um, I have had, okay, so this week, uh, our etcd search in a control plane expired at work and i got a real quick like crash course we ended the, the we ended the learning last time talking about um wait really okay we ended the learning last time talking about node components uh and so i'm not going to rehash that what are what are the three main components of any node? There's a little bit of a review question for you and me. What are the three main review main components that are on every node, two of which are shown in the diagram? Do you remember? We're using the website because that's what you can get is on the test. I don't want to have things be foreign to me when I take tests. Documentation. Anybody remember the three components? What are the three things that must be on a machine in order to turn it into a Kubernetes node. Yeah, if you want to take a chance, nobody's nobody's going to guess. They're like, I don't know now. <laughs> so, learning environment, we did all that. I always go back here, man. We're not going to finish your version. So, that's it. Getting started. Um, nobody wants to answer, so I'm going to answer. They are... The kubelet, uh, the cube proxy, cube dash proxy, and the container runtime. Kubelet for sure. Right? The kubelet, the proxy, and the container runtime. Now, there's no multiple choice test questions for this exam, so so I'm going to be, um, you know, skipping that learning environment, production environment, best practices. Let's go skip right to concepts. Uh, overview, we covered the overview. Uh, what is Kubernetes? We covered this. Um, I'm, I'm catching us up to where we were. We went through all three. What is Kubernetes? Go back and watch the other videos. Uh, it's an orchestrator for containers that run across. Uh, this repetition, I believe in doing this repetition. Repetition is the mother of learning, right? Bavtarenya, Matsuchenya in Russian. Um, so I'm going to go. So, so Kubernetes is a is a way to orchestrate a bunch of containers that are running on a bunch of machines that are running agents on them called called they're called nodes, and and they are taking care of the workload. Uh, the container runtimes that are running on those machines uh, are used by Kubernetes, but are not only usable by Kubernetes in the current architecture. Even though the future looks like there's going to be more and more operating systems that are directly tied to Kubernetes with read-only underlying uh, the file systems so that you can't break out and break in. And so we had, we actually had a, to, to uh, prove that we were compliant with a security, a Kubernetes security violation this week. It was quite a heated debate about whether we were in, whether we were covered and everything. And it turns out we were because, you know, these these questions about what's going on with the container engine are really important, like whether it's running as root and stuff like that. So um, here's the architecture diagram again. So as I said, it's missing a huge component from here. Uh, Kproxy, kubelet, and container container runtime. I'm going to re remind myself of this again for the third time. So etcd is where uh, etcd is now included. Remember, I've, I've talked about the cell and the mitochondria, right? So the etcd is now included inside of the control plane infrastructure. So is core OS, core DNS, which wasn't before. Uh, I, I don't mind sharing that at our enterprise environment, when we deployed when, you know, some years ago, uh, if not just a year ago, not me though, they it was possible to have etcd be external to this. And so they, they installed etcd by itself uh, with its own certificate set up and everything and, and their own separate scripts to set up the certificates. And then those certificates expired and it caused our entire dev cluster to instantly stop. So that has now all been taken care of and I'm just going to summarize it for you. So if you use the standard Kubernetes build and you use the etcd that comes with Q with the modern versions of Kubernetes, etcd is now managed internally so that when you do any upgrade at all, it reissues the certifications. And there is always an upgrade every year. If you're not upgrading your Kubernetes control plan every year, you are bad. <laughs> you will get in big trouble. So, but if you, so the assumption, of course, with the etcd stuff appears to be if you upgrade your 
your control plan, if you could upgrade all of your Kubernetes, like we're on what I think we're one, two, zero, oh, one, two, one, you know, and one, two, two is coming, which is going to have ephemeral pods and stuff. That's really cool. So if you, you know, keep up relatively well with the Kubernetes, uh, cluster versions, um, then you should never have to worry about uh, reissuing certs. That should be taken care for internally. Uh, the commands that I learned about for certs actually don't exist. And the reason I'm going through all of this is because I want you to understand the justification for, for the learning that I want to do today and possibly over the weekend. Um, uh, it doesn't look like we have anything big planned in terms of my, 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 my wife and I this weekend. So I'm probably going to be doing some accelerated Kubernetes learning on Saturday and Sunday as well. Uh, with the afternoons. Uh, in the morning, I always save the mornings for my best brain time. That's either my best writing time or my best coding time. So, But the afternoons, I tend to use the afternoons for study time because I have a decent brain, but I don't need the really, really sharp brain that I have in the morning. Everybody's different. It's, you'll, you'll come to understand you know, how your brain works at different times of day. Some people are night people. Um, so based on that, uh, I will be um, continuing to do some of this, and that I might be able to pull all this out. The reason... So let me jump ahead. So the, the end result of this is we have installed using kind. So we didn't do that during this, uh, this playlist session of learning, but I learned Kubernetes by using kind. I use Docker by using Docker desktop. I, or whatever, you know, I just download use a script here for Docker. Uh, I start out using kind because everybody recommended it and continues to recommend kind for lots of great reasons. Um, but in, in, and that's you know that's Kubernetes running inside of a Docker framework emulated, uh, but you know very accurate. Um, and then you have Minikube, which is a virtual machine using whatever driver you want, uh, including Docker, where you know you have an actual the idea of a machine and everything. And and we've been using that Minikube for a long time. And Minikube comes with all of the stuff that comes with Docker Desktop. So if you don't want to pay the money for Docker Desktop, you can use Minikube on Mac or Linux or Mac or Windows. And you can have a consistent experience. In fact, my recommended uh, plan for the um, uh, going forward in, in our beginner boost is going to be probably Minikube. I'll say, look, you can either install Docker Desktop, you can install Minikube, your pick. But there is a third option that's listed on the website about how to get this. So let me go ahead and go back here. And it's this third option that I want to start entertaining possibilities today. And I want to talk about that. So the third option is setting up a semi production environment, a pseudo production environment, an actual Kubernetes environment, not a simulated one, a real one, you know, um, and, and by the way, I'm, you know, so, so let's see. So, so here we go. Download Kubernetes. So this, uh, this tells you some of the different ways to get Kubernetes. Uh, no matter what you have to install kubectl, uh, that is your gateway. That's the client into everything you do. Um, so you have install QB on Linux, Mac, and Windows. That is mandatory. Um, but beyond that, um, uh, download Kubernetes by filtering version. It seems like they've changed it. I feel like they've changed it. Um, download Kubernetes cluster onto my machine into the cloud or the data center. So the the so we had kind. We have Minikube. Both of them are emulated single node clusters on, run on your desktop, which are great for development and testing and stuff. And then you have real Kubernetes, right? So my question is, because here's why. I went to go use the command that's recommended for looking up cert expiration. Hey, Taniwa, welcome. There's our VIP, there's our Kubernetes VIP in the house, one of them anyway. Um, and so, so I went to go, I went to go use, I read all about, I read all about cert expiration and everything. And I went to do it on our on our our planes and everything, and I and our, you know I logged into our head nodes and stuff, a uh, control plane actually, and I I ran kubeadm. Now we're going to talk about microcates. I don't think it's quite there. I'm going to actually do the other one. So, um, you know, uh, I, and I went to go run my cert commands. There are cert commands to show you what your your processes are, where you're at. Uh, how long you have before your expiration goes away. There's a, there's a cube ADM command. That was the first time, by the way, that I'd ever executed a cube ADM command in my life, ever. Because I'm you know still training, and that's kind of on the node side of things, and not so much on the CCAD side of things. And then most of my work uh, has been CCAD. By the way, my demo went really great. Um, we were able to identify some new things. We're going to try to seek out some customizations to JupyterHub, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, I stream every, every day, pretty much all week, my work uh, as that's not you know ip proprietary 
and we got Jupyter Hub into Kubernetes deployed and it went fantastic and it was really well. But, but I, at the, 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 the next step is I've been informed that there's over a hundred images that they want to be able to pick from, including their ability to customize any image, which means a pretty serious hack to the, to the Jupyter Hub configuration code. So that's all I'll be diving into next week. If you want to watch how to do that, uh, the end goal being that they can type it in, uh, you made what? <laughs> you made it. You made you made Jupiter Hub, or did you make micro Kubernetes micro Kates? Which thing did you make? <laughs> okay. Oh, you made it here. Oh, you made it here. Okay, okay. I thought maybe you made. <laughs> We've had some pretty heavy hitters here, so I thought maybe you made it. Like made it, <laughs> made micro Kubernetes or something. Uh, makes cert rotation so much easier. It really does. And so, Tiny Mile, I'll just repeat really quick since you're here. We had an issue this week at work where the certs for SED expired suddenly with really weird timestamps on them. And we're like, what? And it turned out that the SED was installed as a separate component outside of the scope of Kubernetes. And so it wasn't being managed by our updates. And everybody was under the assumption that the search were being managed by the updates according to the documentation. And boom, our dev cluster went down like instantly. Um, and as I understand it, that was because it was installed before uh, you could, etcd was kind of an integrated part of the whole thing. And um, it, it was actually right on the same day I was supposed to do my demo. So I learned a lot about QEDM and search and everything that day. And based on that learning, I also realized that my test environment is insufficient for me to test many of the kubeadm commands including the one i used to you know in the production out to try to look up you know where our search status was can't do it you can't do it in can't do it in minikube actually kind of think you can do it uh well it, it was a pretty old cluster yeah our stuff is all rancher stuff longhorn yeah, I'm thinking about doing Rancher and my own stuff too. So the, the 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 net of this is that for the next two or three hours or whatever, I want to entertain the possibilities of using what the, what I now understand is um, you know VBox. There's a VBox manager command line, and I want to. I don't necessarily want to use you know Vagrant or Terraform or something like that, but I very clearly need to get a real virtual <laughs> machine uh k3s for the one everybody keeps saying that but i don't agree i i think i think micro kubernetes is is a different thing they're talking about micro k8s or k3s which is uh i actually here's the thing i really 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 want to learn k3s because i personally want to my end goal my my five-year plan at the moment is to be able to write operators for K3S deployments that act that, that are bringing together electrical electrical sensors and things like that. So we're do edge computing with K3S and write the operators for those, for those, for those micro Kubernetes clusters. That's what I personally, cause I really want to get into electronics and I personally would like to do that. Eventually I would like to be able to write the operators for k3s and all of the stuff that they're doing on edge and and possibly over five to ten years you know get a job writing you know code for whatever type of edge computing that's using kubernetes um at some point so that's my five to ten year plan doing this stuff but but what i'm doing right now and i'm just kind of long-winded about this but what i'm doing right now requires that i have an absolute thorough understanding of enterprise scale kubernetes vanilla kubernetes not even OpenShift. And that includes node management and things like that, stuff that might be left off of K3S. And that's kind of the problem I have with Minikube. Minikube, I mean, I love it. So far, I've really loved it. But Minikube has no idea of nodes. This is what I want to do. So I went to go test it. I said, Minikube SSH, which gets me on my node. Oh, okay, fine. I'm going to start my Minikube. Give me a sec. Um, this takes a while. This takes longer than kind, by the way, but it's fine. So I'm running a VirtualBox VM that has to fire up two CPUs uh, to give it that to make that work, and uh, I I take this down when I when I do Witcher and stuff at the end. Okay, let's see here. All right, I'm just looking at the chat here while I do this. Okay, so then uh, for anyone unfamiliar with GoLang, there's a way to write operators using Ansible. What? What? You need to post that. Dude, 
I am obsessed with operators lately. It is taking everything in me to not just code operators during my go time. I just, all I want to do is code operators. I think operators are the future. I think they are. I, I really do. Oh, thank you for that. I'm going to share that. Um, so if you're not in the Twitch, um, I'm going to go visit this really quick. So Smiley here in Twitch is, is sharing with us this, uh, this Ansible authoring, operator authoring framework. If Ansible is thinking about helping you write author uh, operators, there, then there's people already thinking about the problem with Helm. There's people already thinking about encapsulating, ba basically making operators the method of installation for Kubernetes software. That that is that is significant. If Ansible's thinking about it, then that means there's other people thinking about, you know, dropping things like Helm and using operators for installation. Um, so yeah, that's like really cool. I'm going to add that. So there you go. Um, everybody has it in the Twitch chat and the YouTube chat. If we got a few people in YouTube, I can post it, paste it to you. I have a few, not a much, not many, but there's a link for it in YouTube. Um, I am also working on a matrix installation that'll, uh, hopefully bridge all of our chat methods. And, uh, we'll talk about that later. So, um, anyway, so I have my cluster now. So this is what I'm talking about. So I went to do this. I went to go check to see if I could practice the cert command on Minikube. And no, you know why? There's no cube ADM. <laughs> there's, there's not even cube ADM installed. Was the day one use case for operator framework? Was it really? A day one use case for the operator framework. Interesting. Interesting. I'm really glad to hear that. Ansible was a day one use case for the operator framework. That's like a very important statement. Um, I love it. Okay, so let me just say, there's a lot of talk about Knative right now at work. I, w I wonder if I should chime in on that, but uh, Knative is pretty involved and I don't know if I want to dive into that right now. Um, so let's let's do this. I don't even know if it's practical to install kubeadm on here or even it's even possible. I don't know. Is this I think this is this is no this is this is not Debian. This is this is Alpine, right? I'm just taking a stab in the dark. <laughs> Operators is they encourage state and add pressure to etcd, which is already struggling. Damn it. Well, we need state. People add operators when they don't need it. Oh, there's going to be a lot more of that going on because it's an easier way to install than Helm because Helm sucks. <laughs> Fight me. <laughs> I hate Helm. I, I'm... I finally just, I'm not even shy about saying so. I know that it's a necessary evil right now, but I hate it. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't, okay. I don't know how to test my, my commands for checking out search and stuff. At NAML, I know. I, I like NAML. I hope NAML becomes a thing. I really do. The thing that's so cool about NAML is you could get all the stuff the way you want it and then you could export it. Yeah. There's customize. I don't think customize is there yet. You know what? I don't know though. I haven't used it. Maybe I need to give customize another look. I got my head just swimming with all the possibilities. But strictly speaking today, I kind of want to focus on how the fuck do I test kubeadm? Right now, I can't test kubeadm on my local system. That's the problem. So I'm going to put that in my log here. I'll, I'll rename this to log. Um, question. How do, how do I practice kubeadm commands? So minikube doesn't need it. There's cause, yeah. I don't know. I... I want to, so customize versus Helm. That's something I want to entertain on my own, and I don't know. I have no clue. I've heard people say customize is Docker Compose for Kubernetes. And I have no idea what that means. 
Uh, I've been telling people that they don't need to use Docker Compose because it's just wasted knowledge. And Q Macro has disagreed with me. He's like very respectfully. He's like, you know, that that's that helps to build an understanding because when you move into other things. But I I don't want to waste time learning things I don't need to learn. Uh, Helm handles things, customized doesn't. Right, absolutely. So well, that's the thing. I don't know if Naml is going to cover everything. I think I this is the workflow. I'm going to play around with this. Was this one on this topic? It looks like people want to talk about it. So if you don't if you don't know what I'm talking about, you have to follow it in Twitch. I'm, I'm not going to put the chat on the screen. But people are talking. So people are talking about customize and and so Helm is Helm is the pack. I hate using the term, but it's the way to package configuration and put it all in one. So you have lots of you ultimately you get a lot of YAML data, YAML files that get applied to your Kubernetes cluster. And as I understand NAML, uh, yeah, as I understand NAML, the workflow for creating an installation would go as so. You would create uh, in, a, in an environment is a templating engine. It absolutely is. Helm is just a template engine. It's all it is. But it has to have a template engine because there's no way to... to, 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 to uh, Kubernetes is so declarative, there's no way to put imperative logic in there. So you have to script that. And, and and the templates is an attempt to script it, but it's not even good enough because you still have to do bash scripting and other stuff on top of your Helm chart. So now you got bash scripts plus your Helm chart. Every company I've talked to has some extra thing that they do to have an overlay to, to modify the Helm templates because they're not good enough. So there's there's always... The, this extra layer, you know, so there's like, there's like the raw YAML files and then there's the templates and then there's the scripts on top of the templates and then there's the deployment script on top of that, you know, it gets really hairy and it's, it's not easy. It's not package management. That's not package. Package management is when you like apt install and it just works. That is not Helm <laughs> right now. So, um, Helm deficiencies led to operators. Yes, and and so this is the problem. This is why I think operators might end up fixing it. But so my understanding with the NAML, the 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 experimental NAML workflow for de, for deployment would be something like this, and I can I can see a couple of flaws with it. But but so what they would do with Helm instead of Helm is let's say you know some some company wants to deploy wants to create an installation uh, of their software. So they do whatever they want. Frankly, they can use Helm. They can write scripts. It doesn't matter. This is help me correct me if I'm wrong, but they would go ahead and they would take all of this stuff and they would get it into their cluster, a staging cluster, a dev cluster, or something like that. And they would get a bunch of YAML out of that, right? So once they had that, they you know they could just dump the namespace and they would get tons of YAML that describe all of the changes to the cluster based on that application's installation. Okay. Now the tough part about that is I, I and I'm going to ask later, like what do they do with cluster rules and stuff that don't fit within a namespace, right? Well, I think it doesn't matter. I think it's ultimately they just have to have all of those pieces in there. And that's actually another problem with, with, with Helm is Helm has this idea of a namespace. Well, what about all the shit that's not in the namespace that has to be done? So Jupyter Hub has cluster rules and Istio stuff and secrets that have to be added that have nothing to do with the namespace. So you can't put them in the Helm chart because they don't make any sense. So you have to have one-off scripts that have to run before, post, and pre, or whatever, in order to prepare or pull down or tear down all the changes that were made by the Helm chart. And if you don't do that, you end up with leftover artifacts from your installation because all this stuff that doesn't fall within the namespace is no longer covered. So, so based on that problem, my hope for NAML, and I haven't played with it at all yet, my hope for NAML is that you you have this company or somebody who's preparing installation and all they're really doing, it can even do the whole thing by hand. It doesn't matter because ultimately they're going to get a ton of uh, Kubernetes resources, bottom line. There's going to be a bunch, there's going to be a manifest of Kubernetes resources that are going to need to be in the system with a particular configuration and stuff. And this is where it gets hairy, right? Because how do you provide variable changes to that. That's the whole point of Helm is being able to say, you know, well, we want to have, you know, this cluster role be a different name and this one needs to be this name or this one needs to have this constraint on it, blah, blah, blah. And so you can actually override the current Helm values and do this stuff. I don't know how that'll work in yeah, yeah, no, but my, I think the anticipated idea is, uh, yeah, do anything that you want to go. But, but from what I remember about NAML though, is that there is a conversion layer that takes Kubernetes resources in YAML and writes go. It's a go generator at the end of the day. 
So in Chris Nova's Namel project, as I understand it, I haven't played with it at all. We should probably watch her channel. She's, she streams quite a bit. Um, but, but my understanding of the Namel project is, and there's, there's another one that, uh, that Yana from Amazon was talking about and they were, they were going back and forth on it. I want to say cube cube. Yeah. Thanks for the link. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what Namel is, is it's just a go generator, right? And, and it's based on the premise that if you want to simplify installation, et cetera, and you don't want to use Helm, you know, it's like the alternative to Helm is a single executable that can be configured any way you want to. So, and you can start out with the tough part of creating that file of that, of that Go code by generating the code based on existing Kubernetes resources. So as I understand it, this is how the workflow would go. And this is, I don't know how close this is going to give me to any certification or anything, but I really am interested in this topic. So we got people talking about it. Um, and so what this means is you would do this. You would, you would, so you're preparing an application that you want other people to be able to deploy. And you have different things you want to configure. So what you do is you, you make a straw man, right? And I, for lack of a better term, you, you make one, you get one working, right? Um, it isn't in the path and it probably won't be for a while. Uh, Helm is though. So, um, so you get something working. Mini cube, kind, full system, whatever, all of it. You get, you know, cluster rules, you get all your namespace stuff, all your resources are in there. It could be a dozen, it could be a hundred resources. And then when you get it all working exactly the way you want it, whether you wrote scripts for that or not, none of that matters because it's not going to become a part of the deployment. The end goal here is one Go executable that someone can put into, you know, an, an actual package management system, whether it be APK or, 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 or Opt or Pac-Man, for God's sake, it doesn't matter. You can even probably put it in Geeks, you know, G-U-I-X, the, the, the GUI one, the GNU one. And then what? So, so then you, you say, okay, generate all of the Go code for this stuff. And then rather than doing any sort of thing with a template, which is what you would do with Helm, right? There's no template. You decide, you go, you take all that code that was generated and you say, where are we going to allow our, uh, or go get, right? So, or go, yeah, even go get, right, perfect. So, so then what you do is you go through and you identify, you identify all the places in the generated code where you want to allow your users to make changes to it. And then you use whatever method you want to provide to allow them to provide those options. If you want to go all the way to go templates, fine. That's part of it, right? If if you want to just add in OS args and let them pass arguments. If you want to use command box, which I've got, which is a controller thing. If you so basically you have the option of establishing how to pass in that information. And the end user of your product gets one executable with a really great document about how to customize that. And if they want to change it in any way, they can fork it. They can fork the Go code, right? And I mean, that's no, forking the Go code in that situation is absolutely no worse than doing what we do when we rip the shit out of Helm templates because they don't work for our environment. Because we have just forked, we've essentially forked that Helm chart and made it completely incompatible with any further Helm chart upgrades. You understand what I'm saying? So it's already fucking software. Just deal with it that way. I'm not mad. I just, I just, this is, this is why I like where this is going because, because if you start to deal with your deployments as software, as opposed to packages, I mean, you know, more then, then, and then however you package is fine. It's not a problem. So, so I really think that that's the future of deployment. I think that that's the future of deployment. And if I were to make uh, any kind of software, that's how I would do it. One of the things that I like about the Namble thing, though, is, I mean, I've been saying, I still want to write operators. Uh, I need to understand what, what, what Tony was said in the chat here about the load that that puts under, on etcd. Um, because I really feel, I really feel like everybody is going to be operator crazy. I feel like everybody's going to want to write their own operators because they're so, because they, they, they do have state, right? But that means basically Kubernetes is going to become a big old modern version of CGI scripts. <laughs> <laughs> and the state for the CGI script is going to be stored in etcd instead of Postgres SQL or something. <laughs> it's very possible that that could happen. I mean, it, it you know it could just evolve into everything being operators, and and that might not work with the current Kubernetes deployment environment. So, um, 
uh, make it easier for you to self-host your own domain. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't try it without it. Yeah, I, so hosting your own DNS is a pretty scary thing, though. I wouldn't do that. I would use, I would use an established provider like DigitalOcean, personally. So basically, your Kubernetes would become a monolith. Yeah, and you need to inject Kubernetes instead of Kubernetes. Exactly, dude. I th I feel like people are already doing that. I <laughs> I do, I do. I I feel like the trend. You know, it's the ancient trend, monolith distributed, centralized distributed, centralized distributed, centralized distributed. I feel, I feel like I've, I've read blogs from people who suggest that Kubernetes is just a monolith in another, in another form, that that's all it is. So, yeah, it's going to be really crazy. Yeah, people might try to treat it like an SQL replacement. Yeah ebb and flow it does it's like i mean i've been around long enough to see that distributed you know the network's the computer no the computer's the computer <laughs> you know um i would never on my own ddn the dns or the no i would never do that <clears throat> you can run your own if you want to try it i did just to try it but i it's just not no i i would never do it <laughs> yeah if you, you could you could do it it's it's a big if you got email going through there and stuff you, know, you got to manage a lot of stuff. You could probably manage okay let's put it this way you could manage your own DNS server and then maybe have a secondary one. You can do that too. You could have you could have your primary be on your own system. It's certainly fun to set up your own DNS. Boy, that's been a long time since I've done that. Oh my god, what was that book called? What's what's the Riley book that has all the DNS stuff in it? It talks about the protocol and everything. I don't have it anymore. It's been long gone, lost. Um, it's not. Res it's not resolved. I think it's resolved. It's. Um, yeah, I think you know the one I'm talking about. <laughs> um. Yeah. So anyway. Um, I mean. So for now, I mean that's that's going to be interesting. I. I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna net that DNS and bind. Thank you very much. Yes, that's the one. It's the bind. It's the bind library, but it doesn't solve all the DNS use cases. Yes. Um. But it's included now, right? So this is what I don't know. So, just just to summarize that, and then I'm gonna move on to the next topic. Uh, cookbook one, cookbook one. Yeah, the cookbook DNS. Uh. We're not getting closer to QBDM. I know we're kind of getting away from it. Um, so, but the operator topic is really interesting to me because I've been trying to decide. I, I, I feel drawn to writing my own Kubernetes, but my own. This is kind of part of my five-year plan, right? So this falls into my own learning time. I think, I think maybe the interest that I have in writing operators is at least fifty percent tied to the idea that operators are going to replace Helm. But if generating NAML installation files, NAML-based installation files, fulfills that 50%, then I think my five-year plan should involve um, getting on board and writing a few uh, installers. Writing, writing, taking, taking, you know, creating an application, whatever it is, and writing a Go installer that does not need Helm. Basically, writing installers using using just Go and focusing on that as a potential career path. Because I really love coding in Go, and I love all the system stuff, and I need to fundamentally understand Kubernetes to understand how it works. But, but once I have that down, I'm going to start switching over to coding a lot of Go uh, for Kubernetes applications and stuff. And I think that the opportunity for money and for for you know there's gonna there's, there's gonna be a lot of a lot of software companies are going like I, I just think about the postgres sql project for example operator they created an operator for that i feel like there's going to be there's going to be a lot of opportunity on the software development front related to kubernetes but very specifically for operators 
and for whatever it is that gets their application into the cluster with the least amount of pain and overhead and Helm in it. Helm in it right now. You're going to have to know how to do Helm because a lot of people are going to have existing stuff. So I imagine one of the roles, one of the tasks that's going to be coming up over the next five years, if I'm going to project anything, um, it says from the SED and so on. Yes, they are. Um, so if I welcome Edwin on, on YouTube, if I, if I were to predict where the the money in the Go programming in the cloud native world is going to go, it's going to be it's going to be enabling existing enterprise applications to work within Kubernetes. Uh, my current job is to support a high performance machine learning Kubernetes cluster, and in order to facilitate the porting of certain enterprise applications into the cluster from out of the container batch system. So I imagine there's going to be a lot more work in that space. And so that I think that that is a really core need for most enterprises, not to mention big, you know, shiny Silicon Valley companies that want to deploy new applications and, and make them cloud aware or cloud native aware and all that stuff. And what does that mean? Right? So, so it's going to be more than like a domino helm chart that's unwieldy, right? It's going to be, it's it's going to be this, you know, really tight install installer written in Go. I think that's going to be one of the ways it's going to end up. And it's also going to be packaging existing applications that are already deployed in Helm like Domino or something like it and or JupyterHub, frankly. In fact, one of the one of the ways that I could probably cut my teeth on this whole project after I get the JupyterHub installed and everything is to write my own Jupyter zero to Jupyter Hub without Helm. Using Naml, that would be a fucking monstrous project, but that that would be such a huge hit. <laughs> oh my god, I know it would be a huge hit because because right now the Helm chart is, but see, there's just so much Jupyter Hub, you know, customization and stuff. Tried Scaffold for Kubernetes development? No, I haven't yet. Somebody mentioned it the other day, but I haven't done any of that yet. Um, Cobol and Kubernetes pronounced. K eighties <laughs> skates. <laughs> Is it really a COBOL and Kubernetes? I, I don't, dude. People are asking me for all kinds of stuff. They want to move over to Kubernetes. So, so I don't know. Anyway, so suffice it to say, I've never been more sure how important it is to learn Go, dude. If people, if you if you want to be in this space and you want to be anywhere near development you have got to get go really down well and particularly go templates um but the guarantee is coming it's probably yeah it will i don't see why it wouldn't so i mean dude we're running some pretty high performance jobs right now using gpu you know affinity operator hub yeah yeah somebody showed me operator hub the other day god but tiny was just scared the shit out of me if 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 the if the persistence of operators, we're gonna end up. Do we have electron for Kubernetes by making everything into operators? I mean, you see what I'm saying. I I'm I'm really, uh, you know, the guy in charge of the COBOL spec. What? Um. I I hate that one comment has really really derailed me, and I'm, I can't think of anything else right now. I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I want to say that I think this obsession over operators, which I was a party to until very five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, might be headed down the electron path. Do you know? Okay. So here's what I mean by that really quickly. Electron, everybody hates to, loves to hate on electron now. Why? Because why? Why does everybody hate Electron now? It's a really great technology for bringing web applications to your desktop, right? It is. It's a totally sound technology for doing it. But why do they hate it? Yeah, they. The reason they hate Electron is because Electron has has it just it it creates a full. You know, it creates a full complex Chrome instance for each application that's running on the desktop, and. 
because it's being abused. But see, here's the thing. It's not really being abused. It's being used in a way where everybody says, my application is the only one that matters. So the, the, the problem with Electron, in my opinion, is not Electron. The problem is the industry's tendency to say that Electron, good, I like those submissions, lack of, lack of accessible features, security risk, performance overhead. So, but the, let's stick with the performance overhead, right? So I don't hate Electron. It's easy to build stuff with solid PWAs more solid than PWA stuff finds it's fine electron. So a lot of people like electron. So we're bad for better or worse. But what I want to say about electron is that every, it seems to me everybody who's making an electron app is not asking the question, what happens when everyone else makes their app into an electron? They're not asking what happens. What if everybody did it? They're not doing, you know, the Kant kind of idea, which is what if everybody did it? People are not asking that question. They're saying, well, I'm going to do it. I screw them. And in doing so, they have created a situation where there's like a tiny little like VPN notifier. There's this tiny little VPN app for Mulvad. The whole entire thing's fucking Electron. Meanwhile, ProtonMail does the same thing in VPN and uses uh, Qt, you know, Qt, and it's a fraction of the size. It takes almost zero memory. Why? Just to get a little button that displays up in the top level. This, but but Mova decided to make a fucking full Kubernetes Electron instance just for that one app. I've seen this kind of blow happen with Eclipse and other things too, where people bundle all of Eclipse for one tiny little, you know, Lotus Nodes application or Lotus same time. And we had like by the end of it, you've got literally you've got five to six versions, full versions of Eclipse installed on your computer. Then you have no fucking RAM at all. And so the issue. Why did I bring this issue up? I download more RAM from the internet. Yeah. The reason I'm bringing this issue up is because I, I sense, based on what Tony was said here about the operator uh, strain on etcd, that this kind of thinking might be prevalent in the, this operator mania that's going on right now, to which I have been a part. I really think operators are going to be cool and that's the way to go. But, but I hadn't really thought of it. I was like, well, what if everybody made their application installation and management into an operator. What if what if everybody got on operatorhub.io and everybody made an operator? What would that do to the average Kubernetes clusters at CD? In the same sense as what would it do to the average desktop users RAM if everybody made their app into Electron, no matter how small? If, if everybody said, I don't care about them, they need more RAM, that's their problem. As opposed to saying, you know, we're putting unnecessary strain on the operator here. We didn't need the operator to preserve state and everything like that. That state could have been preserved on the client in, in, a, in an installation script that, you know, keeps track of configuration, uh, cache, and, and variables locally. Uh, that has nothing to do and has, doesn't have to stay, store it inside of the state within the, within the, within the control plane. So, so I'm really taken back by that comment that Tanawan made because... That makes me think that we might be inadvertently bloating the internal infrastructure of Kubernetes unnecessarily when actually all we really need is a better installer than Helm. And we might not need operators at all, unless other than to do operator things, which are decidedly not necessarily just to, to install a thing. So it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. Um Chrome has the same issue, yes. Um if we just keep high level state, I'm running MySQL, and if I need to upgrade, the operator knows how to sync, stop, upgrade, start, verify. That's fantastic. Operator to manage my stateless microservice. Why do I need it? Yeah. 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 That's a good question. But it's, it tends to be the way to go. That's why I'm just curious. The concept of the cloud sometimes leads to the assumption of infinite resources. Absolutely, Dimmer. See, that's kind of that's kind of why I, I feel like that kind of electron think will say is 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 a sickness and I'm gonna call it that. You know, it's kinda like Tivoization got Tivo got blamed for Tivoization. Um I think the electron think or whatever you want to call it is is could potentially be very dangerous for Kubernetes. Because they think that they have unlimited resources in the cloud. They can just keep doing it. Yes. Are you streaming? I am streaming. Yeah. Hi, how are you? I got a mural job. You got a mural job? I sound like it's what? Day. Lots of money. Seventeen hundred dollars. Fuck. Four days of work. Yep. Holy cow. I want to be your trophy wife. Keep going with that, girl. Well, I figure eventually when I start doing them on my own, I'll hire Max to help me. 
Yeah. Oh, oh my God. He would love that. I'm hoping. He's already a street artist. He's kind of, that's his thing. He's like. Oh, we'll see. But even because like lots of people hire like Arco to do the priming and the walls and stuff. I'm like, Dude, you can have him run your social media and everything. You'd be good to go. My wife just got a mural job. Yeah. She's in this mural residency and now that she just got her first job. $1,700 for a mural for a corporation, for a company or something. Yeah, she's, she's great. There's big money for artists in in uh, in uh, in the art world, in in the mural art world. Obviously, there's big money if you can sell your art to you know high one percenters and stuff. But the more like boots on the ground kind of you know grassroots art, murals, man. Cities cities have huge budgets for you know cities and places like that. They're beautifying their cities all over America, and they have huge budgets, relatively huge budgets for beautification and so if if you can do mural art <laughs> we're not talking graffiti we're talking mural art you should see some of this stuff and she she actually got a residency they paid her to go to this residency to learn how to do it it's really great i cannot wait to show them off she's already been coding i mean painting up a whole bunch of them you should see the things they have to use with like spray paint technique and stencils and everything and like edges and there's like a million techniques to just figure out how to do spray it's not just graffiti it's amazing super amazing they, they're doing it all over europe too so if and, and, you know, restaurants have, have budgets for it. They'll have somebody come in and they'll say, the Cookie Monster comedy is a mural. <laughs> Here's my muggling. There's so many of them. There, there are. And this is the thing. See, most people know, they, most people know mural art because, because it's for the people, right? It's, it's, it's like, don't buy it and hide it away someplace or put it in your house. It's, it's for everyone, which is one of the reasons I really love it. We're going to go do the, I don't know if it's this week or next, but we're going to go do, they have a, they're actually going to have a run. They're having a 5k where you run between each mural and you just stop and take a break and <laughs> drink beer and then run to the next mural. <laughs> Trophy Rob. It's a joke. We've been saying that for a long time. That's why I'm trying to get, you know, sexy again. So I, <laughs> I want to be on her arm. You know, I want, I want to be the guy like, this is my husband. I want to be the reclusive, you know, nobody there knows that I stream and I'm all over the place. <laughs> They think I'm just this reclusive guy who shows up in her Instagram every once in a while. Who is this guy in your Instagram? Oh, that's Rob. That's my husband. <laughs> to them. <laughs> to you, to y'all, you're like, oh, hey, RWX wife just showed up a little bit. It's kind of fun. Or take the 300 news weeks. Yeah. Lots of murals in Phoenix. Oh, I love the murals in Phoenix. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I, well, at least there were a lot when I was there. I was in Tucson for years. Three years to be precise. I live I live right down by the by the graveyard in Tucson, if you know what that is. I worked for IBM when I was there. Love that. Love those days. Um eh, okay, so so note to self. Learn go better. <laughs> learn to write operators and go. Learn to write installation software and go. Um, instead of Helm. I learn Helm because it's on the certification exam. As Diego River murals, people love him. I think the, uh, Diego River. I think I know that name. I think he does stuff up here too, actually. Oh, we we've been we went to a street art um, show two weeks. Is it, it might be on my Instagram. It, by the way, it's probably worth mentioning if if you're interested in my non technical life, it's all Instagram. I I I, I have two people following me on my Instagram that are technical people. And I'm like, well, I hope they like yoga, art, and running because that's all and music. I refuse to put anything technical in my Instagram. <laughs> I just not going to do it. My, it's really great because when I'm reading my Instagram, it's like all of the other stuff besides technical topics. And so, so if you want to, I also have artivictrob.live, which is going to be another Twitch channel. that's going to be kind of life stuff. We're saving up, saving up for a GoPro so that I can like take y'all with me on bikes, bike hikes and, and that kind of stuff. I've always wanted to be like a real life streamer, like out, outside like hiking around and talking about the views and shit yeah i really love that stuff yeah if you got to run go thanks and congrats okay so we have two hours left um uh in fact let, let me go ahead and let's take a five minute break and then i'm going to come back and i just need to walk up and refresh my brain get back on it when we come back at it i'm going to be setting up qbdm somehow i want to be able to get access to qbdm uh somebody has suggested it's possible to do that with kind I want to look at that real quick. I do have my kind cluster already set up so I can test that. And then secondarily, I want to explore um, the possibility of using 
uh, QBDM to deploy a virtual box, virtual only cloud locally uh, and write a script for that, whether that be through, you know, Vagrant or Ansible, or I just write a shell script to do it. So I figure, I figure that'll be part of the exploration of node components, which is where I left off last week. All right, I'll be back. Take five.
All right. Um. 106. Holy cow, I was late. I got talking about stuff with my wife. Um. So let me show you what you can't do. You can't do any cube ADM on a mini cube. So let's stop the mini cube and start up my kind server. And I want to see what possibilities we have there. How are you doing, Just Perfection on YouTube? Uh, Ubuntu is going flutter for their installer. Stop. Are you kidding me? How fast can I get off of Ubuntu? I hate that Pop! OS is built on Ubuntu. I hope they throw it under the bus eventually. I hope they do. I hope. I, in fact, I think Pop! OS might be based on just Debian now. I think they actually changed. Ubuntu is just like really fucking going downhill. It is. That whole company, Canonical, is just losing their shit. They're just going... I don't know what's going on. Red Hat too. You know, it's not... I don't know. It's like pick your poison, you know? This is why people are flocking to Arch... But it's like too big a jump. I wish they... I don't know, man. But I, I mean, if I could support Arch on, on you know, the whole Proton project from um, from Valve, which has allowed me to play Witcher with the one click, you know, just I'm all about that. So maybe I need to, maybe I need to reconsider Arch, Arch as a desktop, but it's just too, it's not there. It might be, though. It might be eventually. Um, run mount on Ubuntu with Snap. Gross. Fuck no. I refuse to snap consciously, even though I use a Papa store all the time. It is the shittiest design ever. I hate it. Um, I use Arch, by the way. <laughs> I just don't. If if I maybe I would use Arch, but I'd have to use a consumer grade Arch in order to be able to do streaming and stuff. At some point, I might do it. I I really like Papa West, and I think I want to say Papa West is not built on Arch anymore. Let me check. Uh, is Papa West? Uh, Debian or Ubuntu, which is kind of weird because they're kind of the same, right? Based on Ubuntu, yep. All the good stuff from Ubuntu. Yeah, I might have to leave it. I, it doesn't really matter to me. It's a consumer-based OS, bottom line. I use a Mac, too, and I use a Google Pixel, so, you know. I, I'm not going to get mad about it. All right. Back to other things. MK stop. One note is stopped. Okay. Uh, kind. What do we got going on? Kind. List. Um, is she a Sir Manjaro? No. Never ever say that word to me again. <laughs> I, I, I refuse to be. I'm kind of joking, but not really. I will never use Manjaro and continue actively campaigning against it. The organization is way, way worse than Canonical. Oh my God. Hell no. Hell no. 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 All right. Somebody followed me for that. <laughs> I wonder why. I'm not telling you that story right now. I'm trying to do other stuff. I'm not telling you the story. I need somebody to ask. I'm not telling you. They bricked my entire computer lab. That's what they did. By and and I I had like ten year olds crying. Why isn't my computer working anymore? I I want nothing to do with that shitty, lying, self serving, business promoting, trying to get behind the wall garden and make a lot of money company. I don't want anything to do with it. And there, this whole oh we've got a vetted we've got a vetted version of the AUR bullshit. You like green stamp everything and let it through and then it's no. 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 I will consider maybe another arts district, but not that. I consider Element OS. Not uh, not Element. What was the other one? Endeavor. Um no. Not doing it. Ask ask Chris what his experience with Manjaro. I think he's still back on it. I have lots of friends that use Manjaro still too. They don't care. They they don't agree with my my anger. <laughs> but they they didn't have to they didn't have to reinstall their entire lab within like an hour before they had a classes because Manjaro just decided to fuck over my entire lab. I, I no, no, you can't, you can't bill yourself as a easy user OS like mint and pop OS and then do that shit. You cannot do that. That's not allowed. You do that once to me. That's it. We're done. I don't no forgiveness. 
<laughs> so I will never, ever, ever use Manjaro again. I don't even know what a DRP is. <laughs> no, I need that. It was like six systems in my front room. Uh, there, there's a million ways to get around it. I know it doesn't matter because some of the systems were systems that they had taken home. I had issued laptops to all these kids and they clicked on a little graphic upgrade operating system button like I had diligently taught them to do. Boom. Then they go to try to get help and people scream at them and say, why are you using the graphic installer for your upgrade? And those kids are saying, because that's what Mr. Rob said to do. And it said right there to click on the button and do it. He goes, oh, you're so stupid. You should have used the TTY to install that. You should never fucking trust the GUI for an install. And I'm like, what is this? This isn't Gen 2 or Arch. This is Mon fucking Jaro. You're supposed to be the easy OS. There, you got my rant. <laughs> when is this actually going to be a thing? Yeah, they did. Yeah, and I didn't know they were kids, but they online people were asking these questions. There were these questions all over. You know what they did? You know what Manjaro did on Twitter? They kept saying how awesome it was, and they kept fucking ignoring the whole problem. There was like a massive explosion of users that were mostly polite about the problem, saying, "Why does my machine black screen when I boot it now, after doing the graphic upgrade?" And all of the people on all of the, all of the on all of these Manjaro, they were acting like Arch users, and they were telling all these beginners who had bought into Manjaro, uh, "Sucks to be you, you're an idiot," because they were treating them like Arch users instead of Mint users. And after that, after that massive, terrible clusterfuck of a disaster, I will never even look at Manjaro again. I I I might possibly consider you know, an arch distro with the proper community had everybody gone into this saying we're installing arch. I'm using arch by the way, and known that fine, but don't fucking lie to me and to my students and to everybody else. Who's just trying this out as a beginner saying, convincing them that you have this easy, super safe installation because you want to fucking make enterprise money and then turn around and throw them under the bus when they have problems with your graphic installer. It's not okay to do that. Somebody should probably clip that. But that's my that's my exact reason. Just it, it just pisses me off to the core every time I think of it. I I dude, you know what? You know what even made it maybe maybe anger, angrier because I I've been using I had some of these fucking script kitty Manjaro Arch users in these forums on Twitter and other places. They were telling me how to use Linux. I was like, I have been using Linux since I had to compile it myself and Arch and, and Mach 1. Have you ever done? They were treating me like I was some fucking script kitty. And I was like, no, you don't understand the point here. I know how to build my own Linux OS. I could probably do an LFS. I haven't, but I probably could. I knew all of these things and I put them in. And I did. I know how to make my own drivers and stuff. I know how to play the super dangerous. Be careful. Don't, you know, tread lightly for Linux doth be here. I know how to deal with Linux in that way. I was grown up on that. Don't tell me how to be careful with Linux and that this idea of just being able to randomly use a graphic interface is should be should be dealt with 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 more caution than that. Don't give me that shit. You sold me on your graphic interface and how easy it was. If you're not, if you don't want to do that, if it's either one or the other, it's either, it's either, Hey, clicking on the graphics interface install might work, but most of the time you have the risk of it failing. You should use the TTY. So you should teach your users how to invoke their, their pseudo TTYs one through seven. And like all my users are like, what the fuck is the pseudo TTY one through seven? I bet half of you don't even know what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> You can't do both. And then on top of that, you can't insult me by telling me that I don't know Linux because I use the graphic because I use the graphics because you told me to use the graphics. <laughs> Classic deep Linux community. It really is. Okay. You got it out of me. You, you dug it out of me. Uh, that's fine. I'm not angry about at y'all. I'm just, I'm angry at miss expectations. This, the, the constant source I've been trying to trace this in my own personal, you know, sociology, ideology and stuff. Most of the things that make me upset are disconnections between what people present and what people actually mean or actually are doing. And, and that was a huge disconnect. That was a huge disconnect that caused children pain. <laughs> My children, I mean, people, you know, 12 year olds, I have, I have kids as young as 10 installing Linux and some of them installed Manjaro and they did just fine. The installer, I was super impressed. 
I was like, I was chatting it up like crazy. You should have seen all my Twitch and blog and everything at the time. At the time, I was like talking about how awesome Manjaro was. I was like, oh my God, this is protecting us from the arts community, but yet it's really awesome. I was really, really buying into it. I bought into it hook, line, and sinker. That's why I'm so pissed now because they totally got me to buy into that cult. I bought completely into the cult and then they just threw me under the fucking bus when this when it bricked my, all my lab machines. It said it was my fault. And I just... I just, I got no love for that. That, that just pissed me off so bad. It, it, it did, it did bring up a lot of, you know, <laughs> post-Mormon trauma as well, because it's the same thing, right? Oh, Mormons are awesome. I'm going to go to mission. I'm going to spend every dime I have. What? It's all bullshit. Yeah. I'm pissed. <laughs> uh, as always, I have no idea what's happening. Just got to be added to the company uh, with a cup of coffee. Uh, just going to be added company with a cup of coffee. Yeah. Well, it's nice to see you team Panda. Uh, we're doing stuff. I can, we're just, this is a co-learning stream, co-working stream. So when I'm not ranting, we're trying to learn Kubernetes here. I promise. Uh, they should remove that, that from the package. The thing that pissed me off about it is they didn't even test the graphic installer on a sufficient number of computers to realize it was going to brick a good number of them because I had Acer's, I had MSI machines. I had at least three different brands of computer and all of them bricked because of that stupid ass installer. Which basically tanked. It had the bonnet mine. It had an it had a it had an X11 upgrade in it, uh, that that broke, and so when the middle of the X11 upgrade broke, it it left the X configuration in a non a non. It didn't have any rollback or anything, and so next time people booted, they got nothing but the little prompt in the corner. And Papawas has done that to me three times now. Because because of after installing Steam, I'm going to blame Steam and the NVIDIA controllers for that. But I, I can't blame Pop OS directly for it. I almost did. I almost did. I was like, I was ready to get mad at them. But then I upgraded to the latest Pop OS and I haven't had a problem with it since. So so I can't blame them for that. Anyway, uh, I can't get into my, my kind cluster. seems like it's not there. I'm trying to see if I can do my cube ADM commands inside of my control plan in my kind cluster, which I think I can, actually. So I just want to confirm that. I've had people tell me that already. Um, and if we treat graphic interfaces that way, they're, they are never, ever going to get to the point where they work as well as the TTY. I agree. I agree. I, they should have said, we are really, you know what they should have done? The first thing they should have done is they should have gone on their Twitter and they didn't because they're, they're a bunch of skip people. When I realized that the company was a skip company, that when there's a serious problem, they pretend it didn't exist and they just keep moving on. As soon as I realized that was how they operate publicly, I was, I didn't want anything to do with them. Because I can't trust you for anything. I mean, if this is a good project, they'll say, we've experienced a really major problem that's caused these significant delays for people and stuff like that. And they said, here's the ways to go get remediation. If that would have been the proper thing to do. But the Manjaro company decided not to do that. The Manjaro company flooded the Twitter feed with how awesome Manjaro was, with advertisement after advertisement after advertisement to counter all the negative stuff that was going down because they wanted to manage the perception because their ultimate goal is to get money in the enterprise because they wanted Manjaro very honestly just wants money from the enterprise because they want to be the next canonical. They want to get enterprise money by being the first arch to be, you know, standardized in the enterprise. That's what they really give a shit about. They don't care about anything. You think canonical is bad. The Manjaro company, ultimately the people that are running that company and that platform and that everything, the only thing they give a shit about is tricking enterprise purse string holders to open them up and give them cash for their enterprise distribution. That's why they're trying to lie about making a better version of the AUR that's safer when it's just rubber stamped. That's why they're trying to make it pretty and make it give. If you look at every single thing they're doing, they're lying their asses off and skipping all the shit that goes down because the only thing they care about is getting behind the wall garden. And I want nothing to do with that. You think Canonical and Red Hat are bad. Manjaro is them times a thousand. I would. I don't want anything to do with that organization, or distribution. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, the thing I like about the Debian people still is if they fuck up, they'll tell you. The arts people, if they fuck up, they'll tell you. They might not be, you know, like, oh, I didn't read enough. And they'll they'll talk down to you. But you know, the the Debian project has more or less. The Red Hat has really great people in it. Absolutely. Uh, most the most popular distros is for the internet community, but they are still big in enterprise. Absolutely, I used Fedora for ten years at IBM. Ab absolutely, Fedora Fedora and RPM is a great distro. Uh, the Fedora co co is like they are. Yeah, so I mean, we can we can fight and talk about distros all day, 
but uh, I miss my drive. Uh, I I have since I have considered this distro. I don't know about Pure OS. I I studied Pure OS pretty. I, it's one of the ones I would like to be good, but I I don't know anything about them. I haven't tried them at all. This is it, but they are friendly and genuinely want to help. Yeah, the Red Hat, the Red Hat. Look, the difference between Red Hat and Monjaro and and Canonical, in my opinion, as a company, is that Red Hat. You might not like it. But it's kind of like Microsoft. They they have always been open about their intentions. You know, they they have never said, uh, you know, Fedora is for the open community. You know, we're not doing this to make any money at all. They've openly said, we're going to take all of your innovations you make in the Fedora thing and we're going to put it into our software and sell it to people. Indirectly. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but they've, at least they haven't lied to you. They've told you from the beginning what they're up for, up for. Manjaro has lied over and over again. And I just don't like that. Canonical also, in my, in my opinion, it hasn't, I haven't ever had the perception that they've lied to me uh, about their intent. They've always intended to, to make money on this distro in some way by doing the, you know, the, the open core kind of business model, like GitLab started. But anyway, Lit all the systems really well because Red Hat equips engineers with it. yeah, all those changes to the core kernel. Yep, uh, I, 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 you know, again, I've used Red Hat for a long time. I, they are a business, so they may make decisions that piss you know, FOSS people off. But at least the, the difference is, is that they're open about it. The thing that really, really pissed me off about Manjaro is they tried to pretend that they were out there for the good of everybody. And there's a lie. It was just a straight up lie. And then everything they did since, you know, if they had handled it differently, it's, I mean, it's the reason I can't use brave anymore too, because, because it's just the way it was handled. It wasn't so much the fact of what was going down. It was how it was handled. It was how it was handled. And then that was, like, Oh man, I can't get behind that. So anyway, let's do this. Um, let's do Kubernetes, uh, not give control. Let's do, do I even have a cluster? Cluster. No, wait, kind cluster. I guess I don't have any clusters. Maybe I do. Create, delete, export, help, load version. I don't remember kind at all. This is another reason to pick one for a while. <laughs> um, build, output, shell completion is a specific thing. No, create, creates one of the clusters, delete, export, get oh the kind get clusters no clusters okay so kind create pretty easy oh <laughs> let's go ahead and create a cluster here and so so anyway um oh uh, do, do, do. i mean it ultimately comes down to your own personal experience but and that's why i have so many friends that are like man i'm so sorry to hear that i didn't have that experience Mostly because they use the other TTY and they didn't. <laughs> I still love it. It's great for me. And I'm like, that's fine, you know, but can't do it. Uh, can I create cluster, please? Can I has cluster? Yes. Um, this is the thing about Kind. Kind builds clusters a lot faster than Minikube because it doesn't use a virtual machine. Even though I heard it actually does internally. Who was telling me it has a Hyper-V in there? It's some sort of Zengo stuff going on. I can't remember somebody said. This is taking longer than it did before. Uh, fighting with permissions in SC Linux. Oh, God. Podman? Yeah, absolutely. I know. Last year we switched to Red Hat because because on Podman and OpenShift, we have some support. We didn't, yeah, we didn't like the path Docker look. So it's funny you said that because I am kind of on the fence between the whole OpenShift and, and vanilla Kubernetes thing, particularly now that Minikube comes with Podman and, and Minikube runs on Mac and Windows. I wrote, I wrote, actually wrote a zettle about that, um, about my, my, my changes in my perception of Podman. I used to be big anti Podman because they feel like I was being lied to. They were saying so. So the Docker versus Podman thing is right here. Um, so yeah, I'll give you guys a link if you want to read it. But, um, and then, I mean, these these two these are really two dramatically different opinions for me in the same zettle, Kasten, because I I when I discovered that Minikube uses Podman internally, it has it included, and that Minikube runs instead of Docker Desktop. When I found out the Docker Desktop was proprietary, I was done with it. Let's just put it. I'm just be for real. When Docker nobody told me Docker Desktop was proprietary, 
I, I for some reason I thought that it was open source. It's not. Docker Desktop is proprietary. Whether or not they give it to you for free, it also just sucks, <laughs> right? Uh, but Minikube takes a little. You know, Minikube isn't that much harder to install, but it comes with a Docker instance inside, and it has Podman, so it gets around all the problems Podman would have under Docker Desktop or under any other kind of thing. Required to pay. Yep. Boiling point. Yeah. I I I didn't. That that just came to a head for me just like the last three weeks, and I wrote all about it. This is it's also the reason I started using Minikube instead of Kind because I can use Minikube on my machine without using WSL. I can install VirtualBox or WSL2 and I can run Minikube on there. I can't do it with Docker Desktop. If you want Docker on your Windows or your Mac or your, or your Windows machine, let's stick with that. You really only have a few possibilities, right? And I tried the one where I installed WSL2 and installed from script and that's the bad, it's a bad route. I can't recommend that. Uh, it's too big a deal breaker. Podman Compose. Well, I don't use Docker Compose at all, so I would never. I probably wouldn't do it for me. Dusk is fire skipping. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so let's see. Let's go ahead and um. Here's the other thing too. I, there's no there's no kind SSH or any of that shit. Um, it, you know, a lot of there's a lot of little utilities in the Minikube stuff I really like. Um, but I would rather use the actual thing. So, um. The one other thing that I don't like about Kind is it doesn't have an exported port or an ingress by default, as far as I know. So, so I don't know how to get to it, right? So, so um, it also doesn't do context, right? Context, yeah, namespace. I mean, there's a cluster there, but there's nothing there. So, you get pause dash a. All right, so there's all your cube proxy and everything. Core DNS, etcd, kind, and then kind proxy. Uh, kind is used by the Kubernetes uh, team to do testing. So Docker Desktop for Mac uses HyperKit instead of VirtualBox. You can use VirtualBox. You're talking about by default. You can just, you can specify the driver. I haven't done it yet, but you can. Yeah, I recommended somebody. I need to test that on my on my Mac Pro. On my Mac Pro, I need to test it. I need to test. Uh, Minikube, um, Minikube start dash dash driver virtual box or uh, virtual box on Mac. Yeah, when as far as open shift as possible. Yeah, can't deal with IBM or lock in. I agree, but the thing of it is, is that the open shift stuff is really thinking of enterprise. And so, you know, that's that's and it sucks for the open source community because we don't get a lot of the stuff that they do because they want to make a bunch of money. Server VM locally inside of a desktop app. If that's you know what, uh, Rene Renegade, Renegade VI. That is exactly what I want to try today. Today I want to actually use a real Kubernetes installation in virtual machines without a cloud. And I think I can do it by specifying, you know, creating, specking my own virtual machines from the command line. Code ready containers. Red Hat's options run open shift locally. Yeah, that's that's another reason. I know there's lots of reasons uh, against vanilla Kubernetes, even if the largest the target is open shift to avoid vendor lock-in. Yeah, agreed. Agreed, agreed, agreed. All really great opinions. Thank you for that. Um, core DNS. So we got all this stuff here. This is the only reason I'm doing this is I want to feel like I want to be able to get on one of these systems. Uh, I want to be able to log into the node. And and I actually don't know if there's even the concept of a node in here i believe there isn't to tell you the truth um and i don't know what else to say to that um i don't know how to get on the node if you know what i'm saying right uh vagrant is written in go yes it absolutely is uh 20 plus core six for ram you you might also do an open shift single node cluster that's what i'm thinking about doing actually right now i have a 16 i have 16 cores so I think I can get away. Honestly, I only need like two worker nodes, right? If I did, if I did a single, if I did a single node for the whole control plane, because because many cube uses two, right? If I did a single node for the whole control plane, eight is the minimum. Why do they need to be separated out? Because do I have to have a worker node separate from? Can I put the worker node in the? Uh, for single cluster, are you talking about OpenShift? 
Oh, really? Hmm. I know. That's what I want to try, though. I want to try that. I said access to 96 core system. Oh, my God. Yeah, I have tons of those. <laughs> we, I have, there's so many cores systems that I have access to that are mostly just going unused in the dev cluster. It's insane. Massive, massive hardware just sitting around. It's actually a pretty big problem in the whole cloud native space. Nobody has an idea of how much idle computing time is being wasted because nobody's measuring it. I've read at least three blogs on this <laughs> randomly that come across my stream. It's like the un, the, the unknown cost of cloud native, you know, because they there's no way to tell the metrics of how much it's costing you for your environment because it's all mixed together now. It would be a worker plus master on one box. Yeah. I'm thinking about doing a single node with that, but I'm I'm trying to decide how many how many cores I could give up. Bottom line, I'm trying to do an actual Kubernetes deployment, vanilla Kubernetes deployment without Minikube or kind. But the first thing I want to do, um <laughs> I think it would be a great project proposal. Holy shit. You would make so much money. That's a company. That's a company that you could definitely, how's it going? That's a company you could definitely get venture funding for. Absolutely guaranteed. If you, uh, you have to pay to use Docker. Yes. For the enterprise. Bottom line, Docker desktop is not Docker desktop. Docker desktop is not open source software. The end. And so I'm not going to use it anymore. It's been the basis of my my boost in 2021. I had everybody install Docker Desktop and then go from there. From now on, I'm going to give you your own, you choose your own adventure, do whatever you want. But my recommendation could be Minikube. Yeah. I, I'm actually I'm actually contemplating another path, which doesn't have anything to do with Minikube. Um, so let me let me just throw out the path that I'm I'm contemplating. Um, so. You know, since I got since I got a few people, and I'm going to throw out this potential boost path, which is related to my learning and related to your learning. Um, in 2021, I explored using Docker Desktop as the quickest way to get to a terminal, uh, an actual Linux terminal, not some emulated thing or Z shell or some shit. And that was a change. Every up until then, when I'm dealing with beginners, we're talking about 10, 11 year olds, right? Um, the methods for getting to a Linux system as fast as possible. The, the fa Hands down, the fastest way to get a Linux terminal is to SSH into another system. And for over five years, that's how I did it. I had skill sets out of SH. The first thing they did is they learned SSH. They learned to log into a remote system and they worked from there. It worked everywhere. They could do it from work. They could do it from any computer they had access to. They could do it from their mom's computer. They just had to remember their password. There were no SSH keys or anything. And all of the problems from that ensued, obviously. Um, a few kids had passwords as a password, which got hacked. And then I get notifications from DigitalOcean, blah, 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 bad idea. So then I said, okay, fine. We're this is not only is this build a dependency on what I do at Skillstack, but um, it's not really how you would do development at home locally. And I'm a big fan of teaching local development. Somewhere in there, REPL came out, which does basically the same thing. And so what did I do? I said, okay, so from now on, we're going to try, we're going to put VirtualBox on here. And you're gonna you're gonna start VirtualBox, and you're gonna you're gonna install Linux into VirtualBox, and I would walk them through the whole thing, and I did that a few a few times, and they kept bringing me computers that were not powerful enough to do VirtualBox. I mean, really at all, because their parents had like scrounged a computer up for like two, three hundred, four hundred bucks if they spent anything at all. It was otherwise it was old hardware, and it just was a pain in the ass to run VirtualBox on it. I mean, it, it, even the terminal was really tough, right? So, and you guys know what I'm talking about. You, you running VirtualBox on a four core system, even if you only give it one core, uh, the graphics in it is just, it's going to be slow. It's not realistic. It's not what you're used to when you do an actual hardware installation. So I threw that out. And then what? Then, but I, I mean, I, my justification for doing VirtualBox in the first place was like, hey, learning virtual machine software is a thing. You need to learn how to do this. But I mean, I had 9, 10, 11 year olds installing Linux into a VirtualBox, which is not, e not hard, right? I mean, it, and it was, they were able to do it because I would help them one on one. And so the next iteration of this, I said, fine. Nobody can come here unless you have a laptop that has Linux on it. The end. And, and so they would, um, uh, been, yeah, so I said, you can't use, you can't come here unless you have Linux. You have to have Linux on your laptop. That was a requirement. And that worked really well for the two years, like before I, I started doing this. And 
so they would bring a laptop. They get all really excited. They find an old one. First, the very, very first thing we would do is download. Mike, these guys really knew how to burn their own USB sticks with Linux on it with Mint. I had a couple of Mint versions already installed. I had a whole portfolio of them. I don't know where they are. They're, and every I would give them a free USB stick, and they could install. Uh, and then we learned how to make bootable Linux, uh, you know, with persistence, which you can do on a USB stick. It's really cool. And so they they that was it. It was all about installing Linux. But that took like a month and a half of one hour sessions to be able to get them up and running with Linux installed and the right hard drives and stuff. But these kids, some of them, I have, I have 11 year olds who took their computer apart and replaced the hard drive. Yeah, they ordered their own hard drives. They took them apart. They upgraded the hard drives. They did all the hardware to it. I mean, young kids, they were like doing all the hardware to upgrade their computers and make them to take old refurbished computers and upgrade them to a terabyte hard drive or whatever they wanted to do before they did install. And at that time, I was I was okay because Mint Mint has a rock solid um, Mint has a rock solid uh, dual dual boot option, and so we would install Windows. So they got a chance to install Windows. Why so it took a month? They got a chance to learn how to install Windows, which was free. They would install Windows, and then they would install Mint on top of that, and they would split the disk, and they would have Windows or or their thing, and then they would run a dual boot. Normally, I don't recommend dual boots to people because they're complicated and they always inevitably break uh, in some way. And I, I, if you've ever run a dual boot for more than a year or two, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so, so then I started to say, okay, screw the dual boot thing. It takes too long to set up. Um, yes, I'm going to be playing Witcher 3 today for sure. Yep, later tonight. It'll, I'll be saving it online, but I'll be playing Witcher 3 probably... Probably at eight o'clock p.m. my time. I'll put I'll put that on the schedule. Let's do that. Let's say eight o'clock p.m. Friday night my time. I'll be playing Witcher online. Yeah, if you guys want to come watch. Um. So, um. So so let me let's put it this way. So, so at that time, I decided okay, no more Windows at all. If you want Windows, and I actually started recommending people buy two laptops. I was like, if you want a computer for Windows, buy your gaming computer for Windows. I still stand by this recommendation. Because why? Because you, you want a kick-ass GPU and shit. You don't want to waste all of that on your Linux machine. Your Linux machine just needs the minimum. You can play 200, 300 for an Acer and you'll be fine. And it simplifies the installation. You can distro hop like crazy without having to fuck over your Windows distro. And it worked. Uh, I, I rent, so At that time, I started renting laptops to people for like nothing and then rent to own kind of thing. And so they started, I had one guy, I had one guy burn through like six distros in one week. Yeah, he was obsessed. <laughs> he was obsessed. He was reinstalling new distros every single day until he got the right one that he wanted. And, and he helped a lot. It was real. That was probably one of the best decisions I ever made for people who have access to their own laptop. Uh, I had other kids decide that Susie was the distro that they wanted. And they were going to use it forever. And I was like, fine, go for it. Others that use it. It was, it was fantastic. Okay. Fast forward another year. So now I'm no longer working one-on-one -on -one with people. I can't talk them through how to do their hardware installs and stuff. And and now I'm online. So now now I'm entirely 100% online with y'all and stuff like that. And I have to make a recommendation. This Believe me, I'm going to get to the VirtualBox thing. Um, so, so now I have to make a recommendation about um, what to do. Okay, so the first year, the first year online, 2020, um, we wasted a month and a half just talking about distros and installing Linux. That's it. And I was trying, at that time it was bad because I was actually doing accelerated. We were doing six hour sessions three times a week. And and almost all of the conversation at the first part was related to what distro do you have? What window manager? What are you going to run? And I couldn't get to the part where they're learning the terminal and they were learning how to code because they were too obsessed with all the stuff that the rest of YouTube is obsessed with. You know, your, your distro, what's your favorite distro? They're watching Unix porn and Linux porn and stuff like that. That's all great, but it was extremely distracting because I couldn't get to the learning. That I, and then I started being really missing the server I had before. When I started this, the company, when I started with Skillstack, everybody could, from any computer whatsoever, Mac, Windows, Raspberry Pi, they could SSH into a controlled environment that I controlled and they could run their lessons and everything from a central server. So they would go for the server and we were coding right away. And the kids that get those kids, those, I can't say kids, the youngest was the oldest was probably 18 or 19. Those kids who were there the first two years who did that went on to do 
honestly, way greater things than a lot of the other people that I dealt with. You know why? Because we got busy on the terminal from day one. We didn't fuck around with distros or anything. We got straight to learning the terminal. I had a help chart and a help chart for them to learn CD and LS and MV. And we learned VI on the second day. We learned SSH on the first day and VI on the second day. And they just started coding right away. And we coded Python. Uh, at one point I made, everybody had their own web server so they could go on their own web server and have it be live instantly. There was no Git or anything. We didn't do any Git because we didn't want to back it from. Those kids went on to learn all those other things, including assembly and, and some taught themselves C and got great jobs because they got going right away. And the ones who struggled with like getting Linux on their systems and everything, they did amazing things and they really like operations up, up things. But uh, a, a smaller percentage, or definitely some, one comes to mind in particular, uh, a smaller percentage of them went on to do other things, right? Because first of all, they didn't, they, they hadn't intuited this idea of server client, you know, being able to connect to a remote server or anything because it, was, it hadn't been a fundamental part of their day. Every day they came to skill stack because they weren't connected to a remote system. Uh, but instead they were very independent. They could do their own thing, but I had to spend extra time explaining networking to them and stuff like that because it wasn't as intuitive because they weren't SSHing in. A lot of these kids that were SSHing into SkillSec were doing it from school and we opened up an SSH on port 443, which is a protected port for most, most routers because it's a, you can't, you can't, you know, you got to let out web traffic. It's a web traffic port. And, and so these kids were, you, we did that and they were hacking. They were, they were on their computers. We had one kid in trouble. Actually, he didn't do anything bad. He just, he was using his terminal he was bored in his class and he was using his, his Mac terminal from a school issued laptop to connect to Skillstack to do his work. So he was getting connected to Skillstack, he was working on his code while he was bored and, and he wanted to do it. So that, that particular approach of having a central server uh, is still very, very powerful. Now, it, it puts a lot of work on the person maintaining the server because why? I've got to make sure it's secure. I got to make sure, you know, it's got a zero trust environment, the patches are applied and all that, but there's only one server to man administer. And the other problem with that, though, is that it doesn't give them the skills necessary. After they leave, a lot of those people after they left skill set, they had great coding skills, but it was only the ones who went so went farther and learned how, on their own, how to install their own Linux laptops after they had learned Linux from the command line. So they learned Linux uh, on the command line first. Uh, no, they sent him to the principal's office. <laughs> it's a long story. He was fine, but yeah, it, this, it's just for using the terminal, they sent him to the principal's office. Um so, so they, you know, there was a big, um, at the time, by the way, uh, the entire school district blocked GitHub completely. The whole district had GitHub was, had blocked GitHub and we were using GitHub for software management. And we had to make, we made, we made, a uh, sort of a digital, uh, I don't know what you call it. Um, protests. And we actively campaigned against the Twitter account of the district uh asking them saying you know shaming them into adding it and they finally undid it they they said we're really sorry can we talk to you about why we have the ways we can enable you blah 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 <laughs> it was it was an actual twitter campaign that worked we did a twitter campaign against the district and we got them to open up the github the github access through the school <laughs> i mean this we're talking about a, we're talking about a school district that blocks you know inspect element on their on the web browsers no it's s k i l you're looking for my old site it's it's not there. You have to go through the web archive to see the real one. This is the this is just the latest one, s k i l s t a k dot i o. Yeah, that that other company name, skillstack dot com, that came like five years after I I invented mine. Yeah, way after mine. And yeah, there's Skillshare. There's a bunch of them that are similar to mine, but whatever. Um, so why am I telling you this big soft story? Because this, believe it or not, this relates to to Kubernetes practice and training. So. One of the main just so it was a pain in the ass to do the hardware, right? Uh, and then so the most recent iteration of this is I discovered containers and I was like, and people in 2021 or 2020 were telling me, why are you not doing this in containers? Why are you forcing people to go through VMs or install it or as I like saying all the different? And like it's so much easier to just pull up a container. And I was like, I don't know what a container is, but we can try. I mean, I did, but I hadn't really got the benefit. 2021, I actually tried the containers. And I was like, oh my god, why are we not doing this for everything? Because I mean, I can just I can I can literally do this. I can run Ubuntu and get a brand new Ubuntu system running in a container in seconds. You want Kali Linux? Fine. I can do the same thing with Kali Linux, any standard containerized distro. And that was overwhelmingly the way to do it. But you have to have Docker installed, right? So that meant installing Docker Desktop, which at the time I didn't know was proprietary. So that was the step. We would install Docker Desktop and we would get base raw containers with no customization. And now the kids are learning, you know, app, get install all the great things from a virtual machine 
but they're also able to throw it away and test things really easily because they got multiple different versions of 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 it right so if they screw up a container uh, they can go over here and they can start up a new container and they can try on that one. If they want their container to be persistent, they can reattach to the same container, which we've had people do. And then they can use the, you can use the container in a sort of non ephemeral way, uh, for the sake of learning and everything. And then you can eventually mount, you know, your home drive or whatever home directory, and then save off those files while still being able to explore them and running any number of containers anyway to do all their testing, which is what you really need to do. If you're going to learn to be in the container world, uh, that method of, of testing, um, you can, yeah, you can, you can SCP the files too. You can, yes, you can, you can Docker key CP the files and everything. So hands down containers are absolutely the best way to teach this stuff. It takes almost zero effort to get Docker onto a windows or a Mac system. And if you, depending on how you're doing it, and that leads us to the next step, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and then you're, you're connected. Boom. You got it. You're connected. You got an SSH. You know, you got a connection. You got a server. You got effectively. You've got everything you need to learn shell scripting, Bash, VI, Tmux, all that great jazz. And if you want to, you can use my workspace to get started because you want the cool fishies and colors and stuff. So yeah, if you want to do that, you can just do run um, RDBX Rob workspace, and you can. Uh, oh, I don't. I. Uh, I don't think I have that. I might have to do this like this. Yeah. So you can use my workspace if you want to. And bam, now you have a workspace, right? Anybody on the planet can do that. They can instantly have exactly the same workspace I use every day. So containers are really the way to do learning. They're also the way to do development. Uh, and then and then enter Kubernetes, right? So so now I've been doing Kubernetes for a long time. When I first started Kubernetes, I was like, well, it seems kind of complicated, yada, yada, yada. I hadn't really gotten into this single little cluster idea. And so we come full circle back to the Kubernetes conversation. Uh, in terms of learning and usage, but particularly for training and learning, and and I the first the, my first iteration of this was oh hey look they have Kubernetes and it runs inside of Docker, and I was like well that's great because I'm already a big fan of Docker and I'm going to have everybody put Docker on so I'll just layer in Kubernetes on top of their Docker skills, right? So you install Docker container at a Docker desktop, however you want to do that, a Windows or Mac or whatever, and then. You run kind, and that's what I'm doing right now, right? I run kind. Kind is kind is a cluster, a Kubernetes a simulated Kubernetes cluster that runs inside of the Docker framework. But as far as I know, there's nothing to SSH into because there's no virtual machine there at all. So that's what I was just looking at. Um, let me just keep going. I'm going to come back to that point because I need to fix that. Then, then, then I discovered that Docker Desktop is proprietary. You have to pay five bucks or whatever the fuck. And I was like, fuck no, we can't use Docker Desktop anymore. We have to throw that out and use something else. And so then I discovered that everybody else on the internet is like, why are you using Docker Desktop? Minikube comes with all that by default, and you get a virtual machine, and you get, you know, all these other things or something you can SSH in into, right? So MK start, I'll go start that up. And I, you get SSH by default, it's already installed. Um, and so what the fuck? Why are you not using Minikube? Especially since it runs on Mac and Windows and doesn't require you to install Docker Desktop at all. And I was like, oh my God, so Minikube is the shit. This is the coolest thing ever. I'm going to use this all the time. And I still am at that spot right now. Right now, Minikube is my preferred way to get people onto the shell the fastest. Uh, and we'll be using it. You can use Minikube as Docker. It actually comes with Docker. It installs it and everything. And and so you can, you know, instead of installing Docker Desktop, you install Minikube. Boom. You've got everything the same. You can still use Docker in PowerShell command line or whatever you want. You can still do everything, but you get the additional benefit of having a, a actual Linux machine set up for you so that you can do a Minikube SSH and it puts you onto a machine that has uh, persistence, right? So if I go exit and I do and back to SSH and it's still there for better or worse, right? So you can have your one main system that's associated with your profile. Uh, and then you can see, oops, uh, and that you can see that it's running. It is persistent. So as long as you don't delete it, it'd still be there. Uh, MK, but, but man, they, they still have a hard time with Docker. I can't imagine them using MK. I know. And that's, that's kind that's kind of the, the, where I'm at, whether to keep them using Docker desktop or MK. Docker desktop is very user friendly for a beginner. It's got a really great graphic interface and all that stuff and uh, and everything. But, you know, Minikube does cover the need. So I'm just playing around with that possibility. 
but but the thing about Minikube is is that you also have to install a driver. And if you're going to use Minikube, I wouldn't use Docker as a driver. That's the whole point, right? Is to get around Docker Desktop. So um, uh, Docker Desktop is yeah, it's a GUI for Docker, but it also installs Docker. It's the standard way to get Docker on Windows and Mac. There are other ways, but they suck. So um, and for beginners specifically. So so so. So here we have a situation where we got Minikube going on, but, and yes, there's a machine to connect to, right? So I don't, as far as I know, there's no machine to connect to at all in kind because it's all just emulated. It's all in containers, right? Um, somebody told me that I can do the cert command, the kubeadm command in kind. I don't know how to do it yet. The other thing about Minikube that's way better is that it comes with, um, uh, what is it? Address. Uh, it comes with so many other things. Like it gives you the IP. Uh, it gives you the IP dash URL, which is um, the wait. Is that it? If I you are, I don't know which one it is. I think it's dash URL. Which one is it? I can't. I never remember it. It's in my open command. But you, it gives you the actual thing you can connect to. Um, I don't remember it though. But it just has a bunch more stuff in it than than any anything else has in it. Uh, yeah, and it does set up a VM. It sets up a VM in the background. So, um, but it, it gives you. It also provides an ingress. So, it's unlike Kind. Kind, you have to do some stuff to it to get it to be able to talk to you. Kind was not meant to help beginners learn their virtual environment. It was meant to test Kubernetes. That's it. So it doesn't have all these extra commands. And these extra commands are are nice actually to have. I'm trying to remember the one, um, and you can you can change them. You can do tunnels. Uh, what is it? I don't remember. I need to CD into. Give me a sec. Um, I wrote this in a thing. I wrote this in a script someplace. So I'm gonna go look it up. Lab zero zero. I don't know. Lab. Kubernetes, Kubernetes, uh, zero Jupyter Hub. So it's in my build script here. I it's called open. Yeah, that's uh, not it. Oh, there it is. Minikube service proxy public. <laughs> yeah, I could never remember that. So, but this is super important. So Minikube service. So any service on here, any service that's loaded into your Kubernetes cluster at all is automatically given a an inbound route, a service. So you can do, uh, you can list all your services, right? So then you can do mk service. Um, let's do proxy public. Proxy public, and it'll give you that. And then you have to do um, what? I do it wrong. Oh, there it is right there. It even tells you. So service, let's see this right here. So this is a URL. I can actually open this link and I get my Jupyter Hub. You can't do that in kind. Kind doesn't do that automatically. It doesn't. You have to set it up. Yeah, I know I can't spell. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> Greg's my friend in case you're wondering. He can. He's giving me a hard time. People will see what you're saying. They'll think you're just a prick. <laughs> so... <laughs> I have to say that. Um, yeah, that I spell service wrong? Oh my God. <laughs> Proxy public. Um, let's go list again. Proxy public. Yeah, well. Um, service profile. <laughs> I can't. This is why I write scripts for this shit. I'm not even proud. Service dash p URL. Okay. So there. Oh my god. It's not in my default namespace. And you can't do dash n like you can with cube control, which is annoying. Yeah. There we go. So you can just open that, right? You can open that and get it. So it's a thing. So anyway, all of that stuff in Minikube is not available in kind. All right. So, so far, 
Minikube is my friend. So here's my my logic. First of all, remember all that stuff I said about having beginners install VirtualBox? Eventually, they need to do it. Eventually, you need to know how to use VirtualBox. Yeah, you cannot really be a technologist today without knowing how to use it. So even though I don't have to tell them all the, the minutia of how to set it up and install Linux and all that stuff, if they install VirtualBox and they install Minikube, they have a terminal. They have a basic terminal from which I can, te I can teach them how to do things. So then I can say MKSSH, and I can say, here's LS, here's this, you can do this thing, blah, 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 it's persistent, they don't, they don't lose it, and then they can just exit. It's the same exact thing as if they had skillstack.sh and they went to it. I can even customize the input or something like that. And, and, and as their learning grows, I can say, okay, you were actually on a virtual machine that was also a Kubernetes node. The reason I like the Minikube approach to getting them on the Linux command line the fastest is because it grows with them. It grows all the way into Kubernetes deployments with Docker, blah, blah, blah. So I can teach them Docker. I can teach them everything just with Minikube running on VirtualBox. So that's where I'm at today. Now, enter this week. So this week, I have a whole bunch of new information. The new information this week is that I cannot do anything with cube ADM in Minikube. And if I'm wrong on that and somebody knows better, please tell me because cube, knowing how to do cube ADM is a core skill for Kubernetes. And we got hit with an outage that required me to know a little bit of cube ADM and had to research it this week. When I went to go try it out in my Minikube to see if I could learn about it and play around with it on my local community, I discovered that it doesn't have it. Uh, somebody mentioned kind of tangentially in the middle of the chat that, hey, Kind does that. I don't know that that's true. I need to figure out if that's true or not. But even if it's not true, it has already motivated me to make a, a, a somebody mentioned in the chat, to make a, a, my own, to build my own Kubernetes cluster. I'm not going to have beginners do this, obviously, right? But to build my own Kubernetes cluster using VMs on my 16 core system and allocating a number of those and writing a script to actually build an actual Kubernetes cluster using virtual machines. In which case, I'll get kubeadm, I get all that other stuff, I can install Istio on my own, I can do all of this stuff as if I were building a physical cluster without having to incur the cost of the cloud if I were to use it in AWS or GCP, and, and also being able to do any kind of testing and, and administration and stuff I want to do locally. The difference is that I can't take it down and bring it back up instantly unless I you know, add uh, Terraform or, or, or Ansible or any of these other infrastructure management approaches, which I also want to learn because those are part of being an infrastructure engineer. That's my official title. So I don't know Ansible at all. I, I mean, I've used similar technologies, but so to me, to get, to get the full training here, I do think that these, that these kind of Minikube options are nice, particularly for teaching Linux to beginners. You know, Docker, Kubernetes, cloud-native-centric Linux to beginners, I think Minikube's phenomenal for that, right? I think it's really good for that. Uh, not to mention the fact that it's prepared them by already having a virtual machine in there. But in terms, so, let's, let's, so, so my personal path is probably gonna go down away from Minikube and toward building my own clusters and writing my own code and everything to deploy my own virtual, my own real Minikube cluster, I mean, my own real cluster, Kubernetes cluster, on uh, virtual machines, on my own machine, on my own system. That's my path. Now, a beginner path, however, could take this path instead. So we could install Minikube, they could get their thing, and they could practice their, you know, their SH and learn the skills from skillstack.sh that I taught everybody those first three years. And so we had learned that immediately, immediately install two packages, install, install, you know, download and, and run the MSI, you know, double click on the MSI for virtual virtual box and download Minikube and run that. And then minikube, uh, minikube space SSH from your PowerShell or whatever. It doesn't matter. You don't need to mess with WSL2. Don't need to mess with anything else. I mean, you can do that later, but you don't need it to learn. So, so now our beginners are like, they're learning the command line, get around and stuff like that. And we have some fun and they get, you know, boots on the ground excitement out of it because they're using it right away. So what's the next step though? The next step is going to be, well, I want real Linux, right? And so then it becomes, well, do you want to put WSL2 on top of that? Or do you want to install Linux into your virtual machine, which I've already covered with beginners and know they can do. Now they're learning how to get a USB image and download it. Those are skills that, frankly, the people that I've been teaching over the last year or two have not been learning. I've forgotten how to go get an image and download it and flash it and because everybody says the tools I used to use are now corrupt and everything. So I have to know what my process for that is. No, I'm not going to use DD. I mean, I've, you can use DD, but I'm going to teach that. I'm not teaching that to a beginner. 
it because it doesn't have validation any, it's the right way to do it but but to a beginner i want to teach them a tool if possible there is a non-version of this uh what's it called the, it's a it's an image maker the point being is that the whole process of downloading a linux image and installing a linux installation into a virtual box has not been a part of the the learning that i've been doing in 2021 uh, or 2020 frankly I mean, after that incident where we decided not to do it because it was taking too much time. So I can now bring that back because because I took this virtual box plus minikube approach for beginners. Now we have the basis for building, um, you know, virtual server Linux installations or Windows installations if they want. If they want to, if they want to test out a whole bunch of distros, they can. And so they can do all their distro hopping in a virtual machine. Uh, they can get a sense of what they like, the look and feel. They can they can practice all of that. Uh, and and do it within a virtual machine. They'll get really good at doing that. And eventually, if they want to take it to the next step, they get another laptop, and then they wipe it, and they do the same thing they were doing with the virtual machine, but now they just add in the real hardware component, and we're good to go. So, um, Belena Etcher for flashing. Yeah, that's the one I've been using, too, but I was told not to do that anymore. Uh, Belena Etcher's got spyware in it, apparently. There's a new one. There's an open-source version of Belena Etcher. Uh, B A L. E N A dash Etcher. There's an open source version that rips out all the adware. Yeah, it does. I know. I didn't know that either. Somebody told me on the stream. Thank God I stream, right? <laughs> I have been having people install install images with Belinda Etcher since the beginning of dawn, the dawn of time, and I didn't feel like there was anything bad in there at all. It's really great. It's a really great. It's a really great way to install. It's it's much 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 safer for than DD even for pros. I I know how to do DD, but the whole you know flush cache and you know byte size and or whatever chunk sizes and everything is a pain in the ass. Not to mention if you get it wrong, right? Which everybody does at least once. <laughs> Where'd my hard drive go? Oh, <laughs> is that raise your hand if you've blown your hard drive away with DD <laughs> at some point in your life. At some point in your life, at any point at all, come on, you can be honest. Everybody's done it at least once. <laughs> so more than once, only on purpose. Oh, Greg, of course, technically only part of it. <laughs> all right, see, so blew you blew oh, you blew a partition away. Never done that. Too anxious, <laughs> Mike says. <laughs> So this is, I mean, when I'm, when I'm dealing with like nine to 12 year old beginners, do you think I'm going to teach them DD? Fuck no. <laughs> uh, wrong is the backups. Yes, 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 yes. Everybody, they, we all have some variation of it, you know. Um, the really cool thing, I love telling this story. I actually did it one Sunday morning. I'm kidding. I was actually writing a DD script uh, that would go get the image and do it and everything. And I was in the middle of debugging it, And sure enough, I blew away my hard drive. Like it was this like three years ago. And I was up and running in 30 minutes because all of my stuff is in my is in my GitHub. I just ran my dot file, set up file, installed the OS from scratch, and I was up. I was up. I, I didn't lose anything, hardly any time either. So I cannot overstate the need for an installable dot files repo. I just I just cannot. Maybe I'm, I've thought about even going to a even going to a containerized thing and running my entire daily thing from Docker, from inside of a Docker container or from inside of a virtual machine. Uh, a virtual machine that that ha does not have a graphic user interface. Most of the bad rap that that I think that VirtualBox gets for being a virtualized environment on a system is because the graphics aren't as responsive and chop and as as other stuff. But if you if you use it to just do terminal access, uh, a virtual box like that is like really great. And that's where things like Vagrant and stuff come in. So because you can just recreate. Um, how did the Docker approach? The Docker approach went really, really well. Um, I think everybody was really happy with it because they could, first of all, they could try Arch if they wanted to. They could try anything instantly. Uh, and I'm not getting rid of the Docker approach. Minikube comes with Docker. It's impossible for you to see right now, but but Minikube has a thing where it will actually take over your Docker commands uh, and, and it becomes your Docker. Uh, unstable with a bad headless vagrant config. Is it really? Uh, a bad headless. I was afraid of that. I I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Minikube has decided to say it's okay, but I'm still, you know, I'm still tentative about using VirtualBox as the driver for Minikube. But that's I like it because of all the benefits I just talked about. So so here we have like Minikube certs. It tells you your Docker host. Uh, so here we go. Watch Docker ls Docker images ls. See, I have no images, right? 
because it's using my Minikube Docker. It's not using, it's not using, it's using the Docker that's running. It's, it's, just, it's actually really cool. So it installs, when you install Minikube, it installs Docker. I mean, the Docker command. It installs the Docker command and it sets the environment right so that it, so that it gets around. Uh, it talks over the TCP IP path. This is the socket, right? So it doesn't use a local socket like Docker normally does. It talks over this path and every other command is just using through there. It's really cool. Yeah. Docker images ls all. What is it? Is it is it all? I don't know. How do I get them all, guys? I don't remember my Docker commands. But my point is, is that you can still use the Docker approach with Minikube. So you can still do the thing. Watch Docker uh run effect uh run it dash dash rm what is it uh cali no it's not cali what is it it's it's um uh set find linux i need to find the linux images Oh, maybe I don't have the list here anymore. Dang it. Is it PS-A? Oh, there we go. So, generics. This is interesting because this doesn't look, this looks like, this looks like Docker is using my, my other Docker. It doesn't look like it's using my, 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 do you guys know? Maybe Tony one knows. Do you do you guys know if it's combining? This looks like some of the old images that I was running from for a long time ago. Yeah. These are definitely images I had before I had Minikube on here. So I don't know what's up with that. Oh, I know why. I know why. Because I'm not running it. Yeah. You have to activate it. Watch. So this is what you do. You do uh, source this, right? To point your shell to Minikube's Docker daemon, run Minikube dash, oh, eval. I'm not running eval, fuck that. Uh, okay, docker dash p, dash p j hub. Export no such file directory. Fine eval. I guess I can't do a source. Of course not. What am I thinking? That's not a file name. Duh. Actually, no, I can do a source. Mm -hmm. It's like this. This is how you do it. That's safer. That's better. So now watch. When I do Docker um, PS A, is it? yeah, there they are. Look at them all. So it's a different version of Docker. So what I'm trying to say is. Uh, you can, they can live side by side, but, but if you install Minikube, you have Docker, you have a full version of Docker. Not only that, but you have a version of Docker. You don't have to clean up all the time because that version of Docker is not shared as far as I know. Oh no, that's wrong because it's a node It's shared across all the different, it's probably shared across all clusters on the node. I wonder if it's here, let's try something. Let's try something. So let's do Docker run. I, I'm gonna try to pull a pull an image from Docker and and see. Uh xrob slash workspace. It should have to load it everything. Yeah. It has to load it locally because it, it's it's in my other Docker, just my Docker desktop, whatever. Not really, but you know. But this is pu putting it into the one inside of Minikube. So the reason I want to test is I want to see if I make a new Minikube. If I make a new Minikube cluster, I want to see if that image has still been pulled and it's still in there. I want to see if it copies it across. I think it I think it does. I'm not sure. Yeah, Minikube is inside of a VM. Absolutely. By default. Well, by default, it uses it. If you have Docker, it will use it. But if it doesn't, it, it puts it within whatever you have. Yeah. Use Vagrant plus Mbox. Plus VBox KVM Ansible plus QBDM spin up Kubernetes on three VMs to play with it. See, that's that's what I want to do, Mike. YouTube and Mike. 
that's what I want to do, what you're doing. And I think it's a, a better way to actually test everything out. So the only reason I did this is I want to see if that's still there. Um, and I think it's going to be, of course, that'll be, what? No, images. What? That doesn't make sense. Where did my Docker image go? Oh, I put RM. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> no, I removed the container. Oh, right, right, right. I didn't do images. Sorry. What? Oh, I'm inside of my container. <laughs> so, that's a good point. I, how am I going to mount it, right? How am I going to use Docker within my container? My workspace container. I don't think my workspace container will work. Yeah, here we go. Can it connect to Unix for our doc section? Because there's, there isn't one. Uh, yeah, that's why. Yes. As somebody's asking about Etsy Shadow, right? That's right. Uh, yeah, it used to be in the other one in flat. They changed that. Um, so, there it is. Okay, so Quizzical Richie is the image that's in here. So I want to try something. So I have a JM profile. I'm going to make another one. Start uh, random. Oh, whoops. Fuck. <laughs> oh my god. It's a directory. What the fuck did I do? <laughs> I feel bad. All right. I'm, I'm, I probably need a break or something. <laughs> MK. Do, 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 do. Why is random in here? I like RM Derby because it won't do it if there's something in it. And sometimes I do make a mistake and I'm like, oh, there's something in there. That's why I like it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I need to get out of here. I need to stay over here. All right. So um, so we have mini Q profile list. Now I have two. I have just the one. Okay. So MK start random. And we're going to get that. So MK start MK profile list. What? I must have done it wrong. I thought it was start SSH P or something. I don't know. I'm learning. <sighs> dash. This is why I hate dash you dash things. I want to say it's dash P. Extra config. Force. God damn. I don't like this. Native. Container. I want to say it's dash P. Start dash P random. Oh, it's using the Docker driver. Fuck that. This is see, it uses, if he finds Docker on the system, it injects it into Docker like kind, which is a new thing. I don't think it always did that. I don't think it always did that. Oh, it made it, but it didn't finish it. All right, fine. So, um, delete dash p random. All right, start dash p random. Dash dash driver equals virtual box. Thanks for playing random IP cluster, creating virtual box VM. 
this is gonna be hard because now I'm gonna have two these virtual boxes running at the same time using two CPUs. That means I'm gonna be, yeah, my computer starting, the fan starting to go off because <laughs> I just burned up four CPUs of 16, I think. How many do I have? I think I have 16. Yeah. No, only eight? Shit. <laughs> I just burned up four of my CPUs. I thought I had 16 all this time. God damn it. I'm going to have to sell this computer. I know I'll make this computer just a gaming system. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll update. I'll update because I, I, I need more cores, man. If I'm going to be doing all this shit, I need lots more cores. I need a Threadripper system. I'm going to be streaming from a Threadripper system eventually. And I don't know how to make that happen, but. Because I wanted to be able to do a lot of this stuff locally and I can just I just allocate all the cores on my local system. I, I mean, it's either that or I log into a, my own cluster here and then blah, 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 and do that. And that's probably the way to do it. I mean, that's that's better than a virtual box, right? Because it's like actual system. Uh, yep. You got to use Metal LB. I've heard about that a lot for signing IPs. I've heard about that. I don't, I don't want to use Metal LB right now, but I've heard a lot about it. People have talked about it a lot. Wouldn't work on CentOS because Red Hat messed up packages, really. Uh, yeah, there are quite a lot of pitfalls. Like VMs wouldn't talk to each other using default Ether Zero interface that Vagrant creates. Is that because of Vagrant, or is it just because I, I wasn't planning on using Vagrant? I was thinking of using Vagrant. I, I'm pro if I do it, I'm probably going to use Ansible because that's how I would do it normally, like the really old school way. So Mike over on YouTube is giving me all kinds of insight on how to do a true. Kubernetes cluster using virtual machines. So, uh, is it possible to develop uh, with Windows 32 on Linux? Absolutely. Uh huh. It's not easy, but you can. Yeah, they do it in VirtualBox all the time. You either make a you you make a you make a you make a virtual machine and do it. I know people that do it all the time. In fact, hackers who break Windows machines all the time. That's what they do. They have a Linux machine and then they'll create a Windows VM. And they'll go into the Windows VM and they'll they'll hack it and they'll figure out how to break it because they don't want to crash their machine. So yeah, answer is yes. You can do Windows development on Linux. Um, yeah. Okay. So so MK profile list got two profiles here, and what else we got? We got random virtual box Docker uh, IP port. Version status, um, and huh. I okay. So the runtime is the container runtime. So that could be container. I think Docker is container D, if I remember right. Uh, this is driver. So 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 now I can do mk ssh dash p random, and now I'm on minikube for random. You know, I got all this stuff going on here, but I don't have a QVDM. So no QVDM. Um, but that's oh, what I was trying to show is this is the Docker instance going to work, right? So since we're running two things, let's do cube get context. So my context command is just is just config get context. So now I'm using random default. Um, and if I do this, I should be able to source uh i can just with a dot i guess and then we'll put um uh, mk um docker dash env dash p random we should do it anyway but so now when i do uh, docker ps dash a it gives me all my stuff and i should not have my uh rdbx rob images anymore right Yep. So, so yeah, that image is no longer there. And why is that important? So watch, I can switch back. I'm going to switch back to my other Docker environment. This is what I really love about this. So you can have multiple Docker environments on the same computer by having just changing it. And now if I do dash a, I get a bunch of thing grab, RWX Rob. So I have, I have, so this is a separate container engine running in a different VM that has Docker images in it. That, 
that all by itself is really awesome. And that's why I don't feel like there's a need to install Docker in addition to Minikube for beginners anyway. Um, you know, you're going to have to put a, a Docker container. You're going to have to put a container engine into your nodes anyway. So what I'm kind of tempted to do, even though it's not part of the CCAD work that I have to get done, I mean, I have, to, I have the same amount of time to get my CCAD, my CKA, and my CKS. So I feel compelled to actually make a cluster from scratch right now. I feel like I've had a lot of fun with Minikube and Kind, and I, I'm going to use Minikube, as I said, for my new beginner boost stuff primarily. You have the choice. I'm going to give everybody the choose your own adventure. Put it on your own laptop. Get access to a cloud. You know, here, pick, get a Linux terminal. I don't care how, right? Do one of these things, and and then and then we'll go we'll go from that that point. So, so I'm just reading, catching up with the the stuff at work here. Um, so based on that, I'm not I'm not particularly worried about about this this other stuff. Um, I did kind of inflate my container a little bit by keeping that image in there, so that's probably expanded the size of the disk space required because they put the whole image in there. It's two gigs, not that bad. But I did want to show that that, that, that was a thing that you could do. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to take a little break here. And when I come back, the next step I'm going to make is I'm going to try to figure out how to provision a new virtual box, virtual machine from the command line to build my control plane. And um. I'm going to make tons of mistakes because I've never done it. Number one, I've never provisioned a virtual box instance from the command line, period. I've done it. I've done it through the virtual box, you know, software. I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You just run this. Look at this. Oh my God, they're running. Here we go. Look at it. I don't, that's so cool. You guys know about virtual box, right? So there's VirtualBox Manager, show. Oh my God, it's been running the whole time in the background. And then the graphics, it's funny because the graphic interface came up really fast. Did you see that? It came up really fast. Yeah, so, virtual machine capture, okay. So, I don't even know what my login is. <laughs> I have no idea what it is. J Hub login. I have no idea. So so there's my Linux system. And I provisioned it with like one command. So by just installing Minikube. I really love that because it almost has all of the same stuff. One of the reasons I like it too is that it shows most of the commands that you'll have if you're using a system. But I feel like it would be fun if you could do your own as well. That would be even more fun. Um, I'm actually locked into... I think I have to do the thing to get out. What is it? Escape. Um, I don't know how to do this. What did it say to do? <laughs> I It told me what to do and I didn't read it. And I'm, I'm like, <laughs> is it right control? I, I have a thing for this. There it goes. Right control. All right. Good. Phew. Thank you. <laughs> so, so file. So this is not a heavy duty VM, right? It doesn't have all the other graphics in it. Um, and it popped up pretty quickly, you know, but you can actually make your own and do it. You can install a full desktop, install a full pop OS, all that stuff if you wanted to. Um, and you can do that on windows or Mac. You can just do that. So if you want an actual Linux experience on windows or Mac, this is one of the ways to get there. Um, I feel like this is something I can share with beginners as well. It's relatively easy to do. And I can always say, hey, remember that mini cube that we used for our terminal? Check this out. And I'm like, what? Yeah, you got actual machines there. And then I can make the connection to what's going on. And then hopefully that actually, well, you know what? Another reason to do mini cube is because it teaches beginners. A VBox manage isn't that bad. Yeah, I, I thought I understand. Um, the re another reason I want to do this is because the Docker approach that I was using did not introduce the idea of virtual machines at all. If I do this, then they'll be that farther ahead. I don't know if you remember the Kubernetes IO page that talks about 
the the origins of all of this and the traditional method and the virtualization through VMs and then containerization, right? Well, if you're helping a beginner get into tech, particularly if they're headed down this path, they they should probably have a pretty good handle on 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 you know what all of this is um, in terms of like yeah, power for machine to run in the background. Okay. Um, I mean, they should know what a VM is. Let's just be real. You, you can't really, you, you know, understanding what Docker containers are without understanding a virtual machine is sort of skipping the history of where containers came from. So we know, I mean, this, this is getting really relevant to the Kubernetes prep. We absolutely know that it will be on the exam that, I mean, at least the, it's in the documentation that you have to be able to articulate how we went from traditional client server Unix architecture to, to where we are today and that path. And the path is three, three main pieces, you know, traditional virtualization and then containerization. Well, up until this mini, mini cube, you know, possibility that I've been entertaining, there hasn't been any introduction of virtual machines at all to the beginner. So, so they're just jumping straight into Docker and saying, Oh my God, look how cool Docker is. Right. And, Frankly, they're actually running Docker in, in, in a lot of cases as a, you know, container workspace, which feels like a virtual machine. So that's actually something of a danger, I think, for beginners, because they might they might end up thinking that a container is a machine. Right. Because I haven't even talked about virtual machines at all in the process. So 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 I'm just I'm making sort of an accidental case to introduce VirtualBox earlier in the process in a way that has the least amount of impact. Um, before, when I introduced VirtualBox, it meant downloading USB and installing Linux and all that jazz, but not anymore. With Minikube, I just do Minikube install MKSSH, and they're like, what? Yeah, and then I have to say one thing to a beginner. You are currently logged into a virtual machine. See how it says two CPUs? We talked about that before. You know what a CPU is, right? Okay, so we say you are now remotely connected, even though you're on your own computer, to uh, you know another computer inside of your computer. You've made a connection, an SSH connection into this computer, and you're now on that computer. It's as if you had logged into a computer in New York, and maybe at that moment I have them log into skillstack.sh so they can experience the similarity between the two. In fact, maybe we don't do MKSSH. Maybe we do, we actually make them learn the SSH command. But one of the things I really like about Minikube SSH mini, you know, is because for the absolute beginner, it, it kind of kicks down the road the conversation about SSH agents and stuff, which is always a pain in the ass to try to teach a beginner. In fact, I every time we've done it, I've always set up the keys for the person or had them use passwords instead. And, you know, you guys know the problem with passwords, right? Because, you know, if it, particularly if it's a public facing server. So, so, so I feel really encouraged by this. And the really great thing is that when we get to this point, it can say, okay, now you're going to run the graphic version of the VirtualBox manager that's already on your computer. And they'll pull it up and they'll see the name. I'm like, wait a second. This is like got a computer on it. I'm like, yeah, see, I told you it's got a computer right there. Look at it. It thinks you even have a hard disk on it. And look, it thinks you have eight megabytes of video memory. Yeah. It thinks that you have, you know, a pulse audio adapter and all these other great things. So USB is disabled. So see, we're going to actually, I wonder if we can re freeze it and you enable USB. I doubt it. You'd have to, you'd have to make a new image probably. Invalid settings detection. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. So this is, this is in terms of learning progression. I think this is really great. But it's term and the other great thing is too is that now for me, so let's, that's all the beginner path. I'm kind of thinking of both as I go. Now for my path, my path is going to be carving out a, figuring out what the minimum specs are for the control plane, uh, all the components of the control plane, figuring out what the minimum specs are for a node. Uh, I will be making one node and one VM for the node, and I'll be picking an operating system for that node and deciding what kind of OS I want to put on there. Do I want to put Rancher? Do I want to put Red Hat, Fedora? What do I want to install? What kind of image do I want to install on my endpoint nodes? And, and I'll have to do all the infrastructure engineering that frankly, I've gotten rusty with. I don't do infrastructure engineering that much anymore. With the cloud, with DigitalOcean, with the cloud and all that, I don't, I don't provision systems very much at all. I say, this is what I want, boom. But if your job is to help spec out those systems and support them, you know, it's kind of interesting actually to think about it because 
I mean, system administration was like the core skill set for a long time. And now it's like a secondary thing that you have to pick up along the way in order to handle, you know, the stuff that your cloud's actually running. Pretty interesting. Yo. I have an idea. Okay, I'm going to take a break and talk to my wife about her idea. See you in a bit. How about 10 minutes? Hey guys, I'm going to, I'm going to take off for today. Um, I'll be, I'll be back doing Kubernetes stuff tomorrow at the same time at noon. Uh, I'm going to go for an early run and I'll be back when I come back. I'll be doing probably coding. Um, and tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's a session at noon. We're going to be doing, I'm going to be doing nothing but provisioning machines for, uh, virtual machines for, for building my own Kubernetes cluster from the ground up, all the pieces. I'm going to jump right into that because I feel like that's going to give me my most bang for my buck and like what are the pieces and where they where they are, and I'll read about them as I go. So that's the plan. You can come back in and tune in. I don't want to waste anybody else's time further. So, that, so I'm going to go ahead and end the stream on YouTube. Uh, this stream, uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to temporarily end the stream on Twitch as well. Um, let's restart the stream with chill-up music, and we'll be uh, I'll be back to do some coding probably um sometime around six ish six or seven uh and then i'll be doing uh, i'll be playing witcher at eight o'clock tonight so that's my schedule check it out if you if i'll keep the schedule updated as well if you have any insight into this let me know and you go ahead and put some stuff on there you can pass through gpu keyboard and mouse instead of in, inside of vm and they wouldn't know they're inside of vm yes now yeah, i've thought about that too I've thought about that doing that as well mike frost so we can we can talk more about virtual machines tomorrow if you'd like to come join on that yeah, um, so let's go. Let me just check the schedule out real quick. Some people have been asking about the schedule, so let me just go tell you. So the schedule is schedule. Um, so tonight uh, we have Go, go Programming tomorrow morning, uh, Cloud Native tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I'm going to add a couple things uh, to this thing tonight. So it's tonight we're going to have Friday is the 24th. So we're going to do um, Witcher 3, The Wild Hunt. We've been playing it. I've, If you want to watch it, I've been, some people like to watch it. I mostly just want it for my own source purposes. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to put day two, day two of uh, Witcher day two. I'm going to put, I'll put, I'll just put day two. Witcher 3, uh, day 2. So, you know, this is going to be my my thing. So if you want to see me play through Witcher, I'm playing through the Twitch line, and I'm saving it all in playlists. Um, and that's going to be at 8, and it'll probably go till midnight. Um, I mean, let's, who am I kidding? 9, 10, 11, 12, maybe 3 hours, maybe 4, I don't know. I'll put, a, I'll put 3 for, for sure. Because it, it, cause time in Witcher just goes really fast. Um, yeah, you don't have to watch the little thing if you don't want, but I'm going to go ahead and do it, obviously. A lot of people won't be interested in that, but I just want to make sure they know what they're seeing. If I'm going to get through the whole storyline, I'm going to have to play a pretty significant amount, at least on the weekends and stuff. I really like it, though, because it's very, very creative and calming and everything. So, um, and what else we got? Um, 
I am going to be doing some coding tonight, so let's do that. Let's do. I want to do. I want to do some more Go coding tonight too. So, I'm. I can't. I'm going to try to promise this, but let's do it at. Um, I mean, at least it's six. So we'll do from like six to eight. For two hours, uh, I'm going to do uh coding coding. Software and game development. Uh, conf dash go programming. And we'll be doing uh, conf dash go. Uh, with you know breaks and stuff, but so that'll be for today. So there you go. There's the schedule. Um, so if you want to see what's up, and uh, I think that's about it. I'm gonna probably be playing Witcher at the in the evenings about eight o'clock every night. So we'll see how that goes. That's my it's my new TV. I don't I don't I go straight to sleep after that. By the way, in case you're wondering, I used to like watch movies and stuff. Now I just just play Witcher and go right to bed. <laughs> so that's my kind of relaxation time. Um, and I figured that's it. So if you want to join in for any of that, let me know. Um, and that's all. Talk to you in a bit.